All right, welcome everybody. We will get started. I call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice that the meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meeting Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. The time is 6 o'clock. We will turn to our first item of business, which is our invocation, which will be led by uh, Mr. Daytron Williams. Our Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Melissa Duncan, and we would also like to recognize a Snyder teacher today, Ms. Jo uh, Houston, Holston, excuse me, whose son Ethan, a graduate of Grand Oaks, became a U.S. citizen today. So, in honor of that. Yeah. We have the pledge in that honor, so Mr. Williams. If you're comfortable doing so, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for another unpromised day. As we gather to do the work of this school district, we ask that you allow us to put ourselves aside and put the needs of this district first. We ask a special blessing for the family and friends of Ms. Susan Bond in their time of loss and grieving. Yeah. Grant them a peace that surpasses all understanding. Father, bless our students and all our CISD family as we approach spring break. Grant us traveling grace. And now as we continue to serve on this battlefield of life, Father, grant us the wisdom of Solomon, the steadfastness of Job, and the kindness of the Good Samaritan. In closing, we ask forgiveness of our sins, those confessed and unconfessed, as to not hinder our prayer. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you very much. All right. Item two um, is our awards and recognitions. Uh, so our first one, or our only one tonight, actually, is the 2023 Texas Music Educator Associate, Association All-State. Dr. Noel, I'll turn the time over to you. Yeah, as uh, Dr. Bob Horton's making his way to the podium, I'd also just uh, like to say a thank you tonight to our Caney Creek High School floral design class. Uh, you may have noticed some beautiful flowers as you entered the uh, building this evening. It was a special project done by our floral design class, so thank you. I know we have uh, Dr. Stickler, our principal from Canning Creek here, as well as uh, Tally Joe Stout, our CT coordinator. So thank you for, uh, for, for that. We appreciate that. And then tonight, uh, this is an annual occurrence for us, and we, we love it uh, each time as an opportunity to recognize our TMEA uh, All-State musicians. And, one of the highlights of my year each year is to go to the All-State Convention and to see our great educators and our students there. And uh, it's quite an honor to be selected. And Dr. Horton, would you please tell us how the students uh, matriculated through the process? Thank you, Dr. No. Good evening, Board of Trustees. My name is Dr. Bob Horton. I'm the coordinator of fine arts on behalf of our over 330 fine arts teachers who impact the 71,000 students at CISD. I want to thank you for your constant support of the arts. Conroe ISD is recognized at the state and national level as a leader in the arts, and this is largely due to your commitment to a well-rounded education, which includes high-quality arts experiences. So President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll, thank you for giving recognition to the 38 students named 2023 Texas Music Educators, or TMEA, Allstate Musicians from Conroe. But just a brief word of explanation, the Allstate process is a competitive one that begins throughout the state in auditions hosted in 33 separate TMEA regions. Individual musicians perform music selected for a panel of judges who rank them, each instrument or voice part. From this ranking, a select group of musicians advances from the region level to the area level and competing against, in these elimination rounds, eight other TMEA area um, auditions. And those highest ranking musicians at the, the final area competition qualify to perform in a TMEA All-State Music Group. 
These Allstate students participated in three days of rehearsals directed by nationally recognized conductors during their clinic and convention, and their performances for literally thousands of attendees brought this extraordinarily, extraordinary event to a close. Uh, I might have mentioned that over 1,800 students are selected to be Allstaters. That begins with a process of over 70,000 from around the state vying for this honor to perform in one of the Allstate ensembles, whether bands, orchestras, or choirs. So it's the top 3% of all those who initially audition that become Allstaters, and 38 of these students are from Conroe ISD. So at this time, our students are lined up over here uh, to be recognized, and they'll come forward uh, as I call their name. But as they're lined up, I also want to take a moment to recognize their outstanding teachers, many of whom are here tonight to support these students who have guided them through the process to become Allstate musicians. So from Oak Ridge Choir, Thomas Kang, from uh, Oak Ridge Band, Gerald Dillard, Albert Vela, Maddie Gregory, from College Park Band, Jeff Goring, Akira Nakamura, and Rob Savala, at College Park Orchestra, Dr. Peter Kempter, and Emmanuel Carraza, from the Woodlands High School Choir, Patrick Newcomb, Melissa Newhouse, and Elisa West, and the Woodlands Band, Carter Frederick, Aaron Stickley, Andy Salmon, from the Grand Oaks Band, Mike Flake, Jessica Calvert, and Jacob Perales. From the Grand Oaks Choir, J.R. Smith and Brie Ravalado. And from the Grand Oaks Orchestra, Leah Cheney and Michael Casagrande. And so, teachers, thank you so much for your guidance for these students. <laughs> so, we are going to start this train with Brooke Abraham. What an amazing situation to have so many that we have to sort into piles. Brooke. Daniel Alvarez. Santiago Amieva Sanchez. Emma Barnard. Logan Bass. Oops. Jackson Clough. Demaro Marin Eaton Lindsay Glackham. Our 
Arturo Gonzalez. Christian Gonzalez. Santino Hayare. Tyler Hedgepet. Georgia Sophia Hickman Chow. Justin Wong. <laughs> Rachel Jimenez. <laughs> Charlotte Juno. Setsa Karamaji. <laughs> Mac Cambada. <laughs> Nathan Cambada. Lindsay LaFollet. Greta Lamb. Kayla Lewis. Caitlin Maresca. Lyle Eddie Moore. Claire Persson. Caitlin Pratt. Alex Ross. Wiley Sadlier. Skylar Schenk. <laughs> Daniel Vasquez. <laughs> Aldo Villanueva. And Zoe Wynn.
Good evening, everyone, and congratulations to all of our students for not only doing your very best for yourself, but highlighting the wonderful fine arts programs that we have here at CISD. We are thrilled to give you all the opportunity of learning. All of our teachers are so thrilled and proud of each and every one of you for all of the hard work, the practice, probably the events missed just so that you could be the very best that you are. If we could, could we please give a round of applause for the parents? <laughs> parents because you don't start out this way <laughs> and so I know that they have had to they have had and wanted to support you all for many years just so that you could have this very time that you're experiencing now so again congratulations to each and every one of our students and um, let's continue this wonderful fine arts program thank you <laughs> Thank so you. Congratulations. 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 Job well done. So proud of you. Thank you. Amazing work. Well done. Job well done. Congratulations. Awesome job. Excellent work. Congratulations. Well Congratulations. Job well done. So proud of you. Excellent work. Job. Hard work pays off. Good job. Excellent job. Congratulations. Thank you for working so hard. Excellent work. Emma, right? Congratulations. Congratulations. Excellent work. Well done. Excellent awesome work. Job. Outstanding work. Not too bad, Congratulations. Right? Congratulations. Congratulations. Job well done. Well done. Excellent work. Congratulations. Look at that smile. Congratulations. Congratulations. Your smile too. I saw you walking in. Congratulations. 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 Excellent work. Awesome. Excellent work. Well done. Job well done. Excellent work. Excellent work. Excellent work. Thank you. Excellent work. Well done. Congratulations. Congratulations. Job well done. Excellent work. Thank you so much. Now it's like to have stuff all over my teeth <laughs> from smiling so much. Aww. I guess you're right. I, it's not my thing, but I'll do it. Not a bad thing to do. Learn something from the Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, <laughs> you don't want to. It's awful. Awesome. <laughs> Think it's I've ever been in my life. <laughs>
All right. Very neat. Very neat. We always enjoy recognizing our uh, just the, the youth and their many accomplishments and with all the parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and all those out there who made it made it possible and the teachers. So thank you, Ms. Wagman, for your words. Uh, moving on to item three is our citizen participation. Ms. Godfrey, I understand we've got a few signed up tonight, which is, which is great. Um, so we will get started on that item. During this portion of the meeting, patrons who have signed up in advance may address the board in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, <coughs> excuse me, Texas Government Code Chapter 551 and Board Policy BED. For comments regarding an issue on tonight's posted agenda, the board will defer its discussion of this issue until the item is reached on the agenda. For comments related to an issue that is not on the board's posted agenda, the board cannot deliberate or make a decision related to that issue. We ask that the speaker address their comments to the board and not to the audience. If any speaker's comments are regarding a complaint, the board directs you to its policy regarding complaints, which can be found at the district's website. Please be aware that if your, if your purpose in addressing the board is to seek a remedy for the complaint, the board cannot discuss or respond to your concern until you have met the requirements of the appropriate district policy. The board wants to hear all the speakers who have to say <clears throat> Excuse me. The board wants to hear what all speakers have to say, and the board requests that the audience treat all speakers, regardless of their message, with respect. However, if any speaker's comments violates the rights of a student, employee, or other persons, I will ask the speaker to refrain from such comments, and if necessary, the podium microphone will be turned off. The speaker's comments will not be streamed, and the speaker will not be allowed to continue addressing the board. We have quite a few people tonight, so each speaker will be given two minutes to present their comments to the board. Screen, screens around the room will display the speaker's time. When the countdown timer reaches zero, the next speaker will be called. Ms. Godfrey, will you please call our first person? Sarah White. Before you go, Ms. White, we do have some other seats if there's people who want to come sit up front as well. First, I would like to thank the board for our recent stipend and those in front of me and beyond who continue to fight for our employees. It is truly a blessing to work for Connor ISD. I remember the day that I was hired as a teacher. I was so excited and honestly relieved, especially because my peers were all easily, not all easily finding jobs. There were too many applicants and not enough positions. Attending the new hire, I was already feeling so appreciated and supported. Connor does a wonderful job with that. Years later, districts in the state were laying off teachers due to budgets, and many were scared. I sat in a celebration of schools that year, and our superintendent guaranteed us we would be keeping our jobs. Our district appreciated us and needed us. Fast forward to COVID year. We were sold as the real MVPs. Having students complete school at home was incredibly difficult and eye-opening for parents and staff all over the state. People were calling us heroes for the flexibility and ingenuity we were using to make it through the year while still educating our children. Now, educators all over the state are feeling the impact of those years. Personally, I am so happy where I am and I feel the love and support at our campus each day. I can speak to the fact that our campus goes above and beyond to appreciate our staff. However, teachers all over are being charged with closing these gaps and it has been a struggle. We are seeing the impact of these struggles as teachers and leaving and teachers are leaving the profession in waves. We are in desperate need. I have seen so many friends and coworkers throw in the towel. What is happening? The mass exit of both of teachers has saddened and scared me for our children's futures. One possible solution for helping educators is that many issues affecting teachers are being brought forth here to the board each month. From book banning to libraries or the wish to eliminate them, and now the upcoming bond vote. These are the issues that directly affect our ability to do our job. It is time for educators to use our voice. We, as members of the community that are in schools each day, have a lot of insight to offer. We know what our students need and what we as a profession need to be successful. We are educated professionals and our voice matters. Thank Keep you. fighting and thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Gary He. Gary Heath, Elizabeth Morrison, Marlo Sauceda, Hi. I'm 
Jordan Barlow Saucedo. Um, one of mine is a freshman at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and one is still a sophomore at the Woodlands High School. I don't know how many of you were able to see Le Miz last month at the Woodlands High School. Um, more than a few of the students honored today were in it. It was a gorgeous production, like entirely student run, hair, makeup, set, actors, sound, lights, live orchestra, amazing. Um, for this experience and others like Choir's Pop Show, the depth and breadth of it, the sheer exhilaration of it, this audience experience as a parent feeling it's unbelievable you're actually watching your child and their classmates in this fantastic production. Uh, this parent credits the Woodlands Public School Theater and music teachers for fostering these kids' skills in a way that made me feel like I was in a seat at Hobby Center while they had the time of their lives. My boys' academics and art teachers and librarians throughout their years, from Buckaloo to the Woodlands High School, have just been phenomenal, really creating an environment where they could excel. Based on my child college experience, what they've been doing has been working really well. These are trustworthy professionals who deserve our support. Please help them and keep them in schools. These are caring individuals who want to teach. When you make their lives better, you make our children's lives better. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Melissa Grissom. Oh, hi. Can y'all hear me? Okay. We can. Okay, so my name is Melissa Grissom. I am one of four agriculture science teachers and FFA advisors at Caney Creek High School. I'm actually here to introduce Ms. Callie LaCasse to you guys. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Callie LaCaz, and I am currently the Montgomery County Fair Queen, fourth year Caney Creek FFA member and captain of the 2022-2023 CCHS nationally ranked cheer team. This week is also National FFA Week. We are 28 days away from the 66th annual Montgomery County Fair. This evening, I wanted to share some information about the Montgomery County Fair and FFA. Last year, the Montgomery County Fair awarded $150,000 in scholarships to seniors in our county. Over $1.4 million was raised at the annual livestock show and non-livestock auction. And $1.5 million was committed to our youth and education here in Montgomery County. The National FFA organization started in 1928 with the goal to help students thrive in the field of agriculture. Flash forward over 100 years and today the National FFA organization announced a record high student membership number of 850,823. In addition, chapter, num chapters, chapter numbers increased by 178 resulting in 8,995 chapters in the United States, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Mm -hmm. This year, 15 members of 15 FFA chapters and 17 4-H groups that have students ranging from third grade or nine years old all the way up to seniors in high school have entered over 2,000 entries in the Montgomery County Fair livestock and non-livestock sections. I encourage, encourage each and every one of y'all to come out to the fair this year. This is a shining moment for so many in our community. Some of my favorite things are the non-livestock exhibits and seeing all the elementaries on Kids Day walking around the fairgrounds. I hope I can leave you this evening with more knowledge about the agriculture community and just how much FFA and 4-H is impacting the youth of Connor ISD. I would like to say thank you for allowing me to stand up here and just brag a little bit on how much this means to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Clay McKee. Clay McKee, Lester ben Benefield, Daniel Martinez, Riley Oberg. Good evening, my name is Riley Oberg. 
I am a senior at the Woodlands College Park High School. For more than half of my life, I've been a student at Connor ISD. For more than half of my life, I've been reading the books on the CISD shelves. These books have shaped me as a friend, they've shaped me as a person, and they have shaped me as a student. By limiting these books you have on our shelves, you remove the ability for young adults and children to find themselves as a friend, a person, or a student. By banning these books that are on our shelves, you single-handedly remove a defining factor of a child's life. Although the board made the decision to keep Perks of Being a Wallflower, who knows what books are next on the cut list. With committees discussing what treasured books to take out of our school, what's next? Fahrenheit 451, To Kill a Mockingbird, The Great Gatsby. In my English 4 class at College Park High School, I chose to read a book off of Texas banned book list for a project. This book brought light to mental health, sexuality, abuse, and traumatic events. Things that I have experienced in my own life as a 17-year-old girl. This book helped me develop a greater understanding and empathy towards my own peers who may be going through similar experiences. In my own experience, the heaviest of topics provide the greatest of help to students in need of answers. This is why these books cannot leave our precious selves. Look past these oppressive beliefs and see that the children you so want to censor these books from have grown up. We have grown up into strong, passionate individuals who have survived and progressed through countless hardships that are no less challenging than the materials in these books. In the Constitution of the United States, written in 1787, the federal government wrote into law the right of the freedom of speech and forbade the legislative branch from censoring books and articles. I plead with you to adopt the same ideals of a constitution written in the 16th century that exemplified <coughs> more freedom of speech than Connor ISD in the 21st century. I beg you, I urge you, and I challenge you to look past your personal views and think of the children. Think of these amazing educators and think of the students who are yearning to be understood. One banned book can and will lead to another one and another one. Stop censoring these books that students and educators bond over before you lose a lot more than just books on a shelf. Thank you. Sydney Jackson. Hi, I'm Sydney Jackson and I'm a senior at College Park High School. I've been a student at Conroe ISD since my kindergarten year and have grown up in the district. My mom is an educator here at Conroe and I've gotten to see all parts of our school district both as a student and a daughter. I've had experiences in the classroom of our school district that have defined me, inspired me, and made me the person I am today. I am forever grateful for the relationships that I've had with my teachers, principals, and counselors. These years spent in our schools, reading, writing, talking, and learning, have made me want to return back to our school district in six short years to teach elementary school. However, I have recently become fearful of what the district might look like when it will be my time to return as a teacher. The recent actions, comments, and attacks from our community and school board on teachers has made it harder for them to do their jobs. Since COVID, teachers have had many unique challenges, and the accusations of radical indoctrination and pro-porn mindsets have made this already difficult position infinitely harder. The books on the library and classroom shelves may not fit everyone's moral beliefs, but isn't that the point of literature? Books give us a window into the lives of others and allow us to see ourselves in those characters. The banning of these books is insensitive to many and simply ignorant, being that right now Connor is in an extreme teacher shortage. We need to worry about providing teachers with encouragement and crucial resources rather than taking more of these resources away. The Connor ISD that I know and love has been inclusive and respectful to all genders, races, religions, and socioeconomic classes. The Connor that I know and have grown up in has most of all been inspiring to students and employees. I fear that this is no longer the reality for our school district, and my heart is breaking seeing firsthand the effect that these comments and actions have had on my teachers, family, and friends. When I return, will there be any teachers left? When my sister is in high school, what will it look like? With that being said, I challenge you all to use your power for the good of all students and not just the ones that fit into your personal predetermined moral bias. All means all, y'all. Abigail Chapman. I forgot my thing, so I have to open my notes real quick. Okay. <laughs> Jumping on the book band bandwagon. <laughs> <coughs> Good
Good evening, board members. My name is Nix Chapman. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm a queer student who has been a part of CISD since I was five years old. At no fault of my teachers, this district has failed me. It has failed all of its students. I learned the word gay through my classmates insulting me in fourth grade. I have been labeled a fag and a dyke since middle school. I have been told to kill myself more times than I can count. This visceral hatred isn't natural in children. It's taught. It is taught, like, it is taught by the parents like many of the ones who spoke at the last meeting, crying about pornography, indoctrination, and homosexuality. It is taught by board members who only see what they want to in books that have incredibly strong messages about self-acceptance, mental health, and growth. It forces teachers into silence out of fear for their livelihoods, forces them to testify about a rainbow in a fourth grade program. It has forced your students into action through spite and anger and fear. That is why I stand here today. I survived out of spite. I had friends who didn't. I have friends who've killed themselves or attempted to. I have friends who've been through conversion therapy and will likely never be fully healed from it. I have friends who dropped out of school due to fear of their peers. We have had to watch as books rapidly disappear from our school and classroom libraries, books that perfectly empathize with us. You are taking away some of the only representation we can find, one of the only ways we can see that we aren't alone. This school district is limiting, sorry, this school district is limiting resources and education due to the vocal minority's cry of we don't like it. You can deny it all you want, but this isn't about what's best for the children. You have never considered us. It is about what's best for your narrow-minded ideology. My fear stems not from you, but from the future of students in this district. You continue to enable parents who wish to enforce their will upon everyone when there's already systems in place that work. And I know that you will likely never understand my plea, but I hope it can at least inspire hope in students like me that someone will always be fighting for you. You are not a burden, not a flaw in God's machinations. You are not a puppet to indoctrination. You deserve happiness and safety, and you'll get it eventually. Just keep hanging on. Lean on those around you. They'll lift you up. Eventually, we'll be able to make a change. We'll be old enough to vote, run for office, teach, and advocate just a little longer before we take this district and the world by storm. Thank you. D.D. Fox. Good evening, and thank you for supporting all CISD students. I'm Dee Dee Fox, a native Texan and an educator for 40 years, 23 of them in CISD. My college-educated daughters are products of CISD, and my grandsons are currently fifth graders. Years ago, when I worked in another district, there was an uproar over any book title that included the word witch. As a consequence, there was a mandate to pull those books from the shelves even the Christian allegory, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and The Witch of Blackbird Pond, a Newbery Award winner. In each story, the good guys conquered evil. Based on those experiences, I hope you will stop challenging district books. Educators are faithful people. We are not nefarious or satanic. We are your allies in selecting the best books, for your children. Recently, I helped judge a scholarship competition for high school seniors living in Montgomery County. Students wrote about school shootings, eating disorders, pressure to succeed, loss of loved ones, living with dyslexia, gender confusion, and loneliness. As much as we want to protect our children, we can't. Censoring books won't protect them. In fact, banning books results in skyrocketing sales. Kids can access anything anyway on their smartphones and laptops. When students read a controversial book, it's a great time to discuss it in terms of our individual family values, a learning experience before they leave home. You have the right to censor what your child reads, but not what my child reads. In history, the good guys were never the ones that banned books. Thank you. <laughs> Teresa Neiman. All of the speakers in front of me have been so eloquent, but I'm actually borrowing Margaret Atwood's words tonight. She recently published an article in The Atlantic. I can't read it all. You won't give me enough time, so I'll email it to you tomorrow. All right. The title is, Go Ahead and Ban My Book. 
it'll only make the kids want to read it more. It's shunning time in Madison County, Virginia, where the school board recently banished my novel, The Handmaid's Tale, from the shelves of the high school library. I have been rendered unacceptable. Governor Yunkin enabled such censorship last year when he signed legislation allowing parents to veto teaching materials they perceive as sexually explicit. This episode is perplexing to me in part because my book is much less sexually explicit than the Bible, and I doubt the school board has ordered the expulsion of that. Possibly the real motives lie elsewhere. The truth is that the inspiration for The Handmaid's Tale is in part biblical. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Matthew 7:15. The novel sets an inward faith and core Christian values, which I take to be embodied in the love of neighbor and forgiveness of sins, against totalitarian control and power hoarding cloaked in a supposed religiousness that is mostly based on the earlier scriptures in the Bible. The stealing of women for reproductive purposes and the appropriation of their babies appears in Genesis 30, when Rachel and Leah turn their handmaids over to Jacob and then claim the children as their own. My novel is also an exploration of the theoretical questions. What kind of totalitarianism might the United States become? I suggest we're beginning to see the real life answer to that query. And I'll let you read the rest of the article for homework. <laughs> Morgan Salinas, hi, um, I'm a little bit more informal today. This is my daughter Zywee Salinas and we're here to represent the Conroe Independent Virtual Academy. Um, we, uh, her, my, my eighth grader, Felicity, who is not here, and Zywee is a fifth grader, um, have started, started in the very beginning um, this fall. Felicity um, really wanted to be here. She had a speech written out, and um, she was too unwell to make it. Um, of August 2021, our co family contracted COVID, and my two youngest daughters um, developed a, a disorder called dysautonomia. It's also known as POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Um, it sent their autonomic nervous system into um, a state of panic. Um, and they both were unable to attend school. Um, last year, Zylie missed 35 days of school. Um, she physically was not well enough. And it took um, over a year for us to see the specialist downtown. Um, this summer, that put us in a state where we had no idea what to do with our girls <coughs> for the next school year. I was considering homeschool options. Um, we were hoping that there would be some kind of miracle and that they would get better in time to attend in-person school. Um, we prayed, um, we did our research, and three weeks before school started, one of my friends said, well, have you heard of the Virtual Academy? And I said, no. And I, I got to that parent meeting before school. It was an answer to my prayers, and we, have not had any complaints. We love it. They're happy to be there. Um, they're able to do couch on the school if they need to, if they don't feel well. And so I just encourage you to do everything that you can. To please, please continue this virtual academy, especially for my children and so many others out there. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Melanie Bush. That never happens to you. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, nice to see you. Uh, I'm Melanie Bush, and I sat in your very seat from 2014 to 2018. First, thank you for serving in an unpaid, volunteer, elected position. Second, I'm here to encourage you. Having sat 
in your seat. Conflict in meetings is good. If you don't believe me, you, if you're confused by my statement, you need to go read Death by Meeting. Conflict is good. Differing opinions is good. It's how we get to the best solution. We have to talk through everyone's thoughts, objectives, and their past experiences to get past their preconceived notions based on their personal background. And again, this is good. These meetings are designed by Texas Open Meetings Act to allow for this. The problem lies in how we as fallible human beings do this. Each of you is elected by the people and are due a certain amount of respect based solely on that. This board failed last month to put the personal aside and to act like the group of professionals that you are. Again, you may not like the person you're sitting next to. You may disagree with them. I certainly didn't agree with everyone I sat next to. But we are called to respect each other. In politics, we have lost sight of separating the personal from the professional. We have lost sight of how to have conflict that isn't attacking. And we are called by Christ to do better and be better. As the elected board representing our youngest of residents, you are expected to model how to have conflict. And I encourage each of you to find a way to disagree respectfully and to push past your personal feelings about any other member of this board and find the best solution to every item before this body every single time you come together. Thank, Thank you. you. Courtney McNall. <laughs> Good evening, Board and Dr. Null. I'm speaking tonight to make community members aware and start paying attention to what is going on in our district. First off, I am shocked, appalled, and feel very attacked as both librarian and a parent in CISD. The very people that are claiming to protect our kids from anything traumatizing or corrupting are the same people who are bullying teachers, librarians, and administrators on social media by claiming we are promoting pornography in the schools. The absolute ignorance of this sudden witch hunt against books is laughable. I think it's crazy that suddenly a group of people start using buzzwords like indoctrination, pornography, critical race theory, and Texas penal codes about pervasive content, and now everyone is in uproar and making an issue of something that's not an issue. It's utter nonsense, and we need to stop letting people who are spreading lies make decisions for us. Here's something to consider. We as educators keep being given more work, more students, and more rules. And now not only are we having impossible demands put on us, but to then turn around and be subjected to more abuse from parts of the community. We keep seeing and being told that books are the problem, but what was the last book you read or talked to your kid about? Oh, you keep seeing all these lists about books that have inappropriate or mature content, but have you actually bothered to read them? In most cases, you're relying on websites put out by the very people vilifying those books because you don't have time. Mature content does not mean pornographic material. It means it deals with mature topics like suicide, abuse, bullying, addiction, all of which our kids are dealing with, whether you choose to believe it or not. Let's talk about some of the real problems in the schools phones. Our kids are glued to them. We're complaining about books, but my son is 11 and rides the bus. My son came home the other day and said that his seatmate showed him a video of a man's erect penis with a hot dog bun wrapped around it and putting condiments on it. But books are the problem. Let's focus on trying to change things that actually matter, like technology. All tests are now required to be taken online, but we don't have enough computers in the schools, so we let kids use their phones to compensate. How about the teacher and bus driver shortage or the fast-paced growth of the district and how we can help alleviate overcrowding and teacher burnout while waiting on these new campuses to be built? These are just a few of the many issues we should be focusing on. This is my plea. Don't be complacent. Educate yourselves and have a little passion for all of those in ed the education field because we are drowning. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Evan Berlin. Good evening, uh, President Hubert, members of the board, Dr. Noll. I'm going to give you a little bit of a break here on the book uh, topic. 
Um, first, uh, I wanted to personally and publicly thank Dr. Knoll uh, and his executive staff uh, for the way that you're handling the bond meetings. Uh, you've stated that you will meet with anyone when we have a question, and uh, I'm honestly, I'm happy to report that he did, and he pulled, <laughs> rallied all the wagons to have an hour and a half conversation on a Thursday afternoon. Uh, so thank you very much for sticking to that. Um, <clears throat> second, I'm continuously impressed by our students and our educators. Uh, for those who don't know, I graduated. I grew up in CISD. I graduated from the Woodlands High School. Um, and so I'm glad to see this strong legacy of academics. You know, I look around and I see a lot of people who were uh, educators when I was growing up in the district. And I think that that's something uh, that is really special about Conroe ISD. We have this long history of service. Um, but what I'm really here tonight is I had the opportunity uh, last week to attend an event focused on mental health. Um, <clears throat> the statistics I know are uh, staggering. I know the district is working on uh, mental health counselors, uh, addiction, things like that. And I would just really encourage that we do keep that in the forefront of our minds. Um, one of the statistics, and don't quote me on this, but it was well over 100% increase in the number of students uh, needing mental health resources. And that's within our community, that's within our schools. And uh, so, you know, I think just as we look at the budgets and as we think about our students and what they encounter, uh, many things have been said today, dyslexia, suicide, school shootings, fear of, uh, of those things. I would just ask that we keep those at the forefront of our mind uh, to protect our students, uh, both internally and physically. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Diane Daniels. Good evening, elected members of the board. Why did you choose to run on the Conroe ISD board? A non-paying position that requires a great deal amount of energy with no pay. Month to month, you hear from residents of this community about issues that they are concerned about. These meetings sometimes last to 1 a.m. Why do this? You're not getting paid. You have so much power and influence. Why not send a mass email out to the parents wanting to opt in or opt out? This gives them the choice on the book issue. You're not taking anything up. You're letting the parents decide. Um, but rather opt in or out, oh, sorry. Uh, while the book stays on the library shelf and most parents don't even know it's there, you could just do the right thing by the children. Send the parents the email. Opt in or out, uh, opt out. If they want further information, they'll find out about it. It pleases everybody. This would mean that you would have time to review other issues. Example, you have success with the dyslexia program. But then last month we heard about a, 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 a student who fell through the cracks. Where's the extra funding to help that student? Where's the special funding to help more special needs? I hear from people about teachers and administrators. They're, they're pounded with restrictions and more paperwork. Where's the funding to eliminate that? You build a beautiful football stadium over there. It's gorgeous. Was the funding for that field, not stadium, field? Okay, it's gorgeous. I drive by it every day. Was the funding specifically for that? Or could we have used that funding to expand the dyslexia program, the special needs program, or give teachers aid to the teachers so they can teach? Because you obviously have multiple successes in this, in this district. We've seen it paraded. I come every month, and we see the success stories here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Missy and Wyatt Sowell. <laughs> Hi, my name is Wyatt Sowell. I'm in fifth grade. I'm a virtual academy student, and I am dyslexic. And I wrote this speech for my mom to read. Why <laughs> <laughs> is studying arguments in ELA? They were told they first must make a claim. Here's why it's claim. 
I believe that students do better academically in small intimate group settings such as CISD Virtual Academy. Next, we need reasons for our claim. Smaller class sizes produce more focused students. Great teachers that meet you where you are help, to help you achieve academic excellence. Finally, you need to provide evidence. Here are reasons why smaller, more intimate class sizes are important. With more one-on-one -on -one time with their teacher, students are certain to have greater sense that their teacher cares for them, and when the student feels like someone they look up to <coughs> cares for their work, they excel. With fewer students, the teacher is more capable of ensuring everyone participates and engages in the material. This ensures students can't fake it, and thus they must keep up. In large classes, teachers can struggle to identify where problems might be arising, and then, beca then because their time is so valuable, they further struggle to adequately address the issues. Teachers can form better relationships. Teachers know the strengths, weaknesses, and needs of each student. With this increased level of attention, and teachers can more successfully relate and instruct, thus become more, a sim more than a simple instructor, but a genuine role model. When students have a strong relationship with their teacher and know they are responsible for their work and level of participation, they are bound to be more engaged with the curriculum. They are certain to produce better work. Work faster, simply put, with a small group, teacher attention is more focused, students are more inclined to engage and be enthusiastic towards the material, and when this happens, <coughs> work gets done faster. When work is done faster, classes can cover more. More ground, explore more topics, and more completely experience the curriculum and ideas presented. Much less chaotic. <coughs> There's simply, <coughs> There's simply <laughs> less noise. It's a matter of physics. Furthermore, it'll be easier to avoid letting the group get out of hand. Now for the great teachers that meet you where you are and help achieve academic excellence. Ms. Benton, Ms. Bowden, Ms. Kathy, and Ms. Page. <laughs> that is all you'll need to know. <laughs> 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 we, we encourage you to vote to keep the virtual academy as an academic choice. Thank you. 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 Dear CI State Board and Leadership, I wish to speak on evolution, the science of racism. First, some facts. Our founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence said, all men are created equal, and our creator has blessed them with rights which cannot be denied. The life and universe around us is evidence of a creator God. However, the religion of atheism has the faith that science someday will have the answers for the life and the universe around us. Religious freedom is a constitutional right, and suppressing one while promoting another is a constitutional violation. Walter stated, in, in, stated the East was civilized and learned while West Europe lived as savages and barbarians. Those were his words. The law book of the Indian caste system, which was established with the backing of the British for their own rep reprobate purposes, was translated into English in 19, uh, 1794. Then this uh, poison of inequality spread to the world society, polluting minds like Charles Darwin and birthing the mythical Aryan society race. Darwin placed the origin of mankind in Africa, theorizing that man and apes had a common ancestor. And every population that is not white or European was to be savage, that is lower, because they had evolved like the rest, like the white of European. Given these facts, evolution is the science of racism based on skin color, which was birthed from the Indian caste system. So I have two questions for all of us to think about, CIST board and leadership. Why are we suppressing the faith and equality principles of our founding fathers, who said all men were created equal? And why are we teaching evolution, which is critical race theory? Thank you. Thank you. Emily Kress. All right, I'm taking three minutes into two, so I'm going to talk really fast. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening. Fear. It's a word I've heard behind this podium a few times these last couple months as I listen to meetings. Fear educators have each and every day that they may do something that someone misconstrues into something else and blast them on social media to try and ruin their credibility. For example, recently a teacher was bashed for rainbow umbrellas in a school play. 
or even more recently, teachers and staff who volunteered their time to be on an anonymous book committee were outed by a local media site. However, this is not my fear. My fear is for the future of public education. This is my 13th year as an educator, and in the last three years, I have seen mass exits in the schools that I work in. It's not because of books or student behaviors. It's because of pressure and workload. Every year we are mandated to do more. Reading Academy, HB 4545, PLC, data meetings, grading, multiple kinds of assessments, committee meetings, and the list goes on. I have a four and two year old at home and it terrifies me to think that if we continue on this path, what educators will be left for them. I became an educator because I have a passion to make a difference in each and every child's life that walks through my classroom door, whether they're on my roster or not. Once you are my student, you will always be my student. I will do anything I can for them at any time because that is what teachers do. It's not just about teaching curriculum, it's about teaching the whole child. Kids don't just come to school with empty minds ready to learn. They sometimes come with problems and I'm there to hear them and help them navigate their way through those big feelings. Last month, I helped a student who reached out to me that I taught in 2009 in Illinois. She was visiting here in Texas and her car broke down. Guess who she called? Me. I gave her a place to stay for the evening, towed her car to my house, and it sat there for a month until she could afford to get it fixed. That is what educators do. We aren't just here for your child's life for a year. We hope to make an impact on them for a lifetime. I do this job for them, not for you, not for anyone else. So I'll tell all my fellow educators out there listening, never forget your why and never let anyone take away your passion for this career. We need to continue to stand up for our students and do everything we can to make them successful. Psalm Lawrence. and a lover of philosophy, I found the recent ban on books disheartening. I spoke at the board meeting in November of 2021, and now here I am almost two years later. I've been an AP and dual enrollment student all of high school, and I'm currently an AP literature and composition student, and the class has an amazing curriculum. We read incredible material throughout the year, such as Kite Runner, Hamlet, and many other literary works. We're currently in our dystopian literature examination, I just finished reading Aldous Huxley's most notable and thought-provoking novel, Brave New World. Since, I've, since the last time I've spoken, I've assumed the position of senior class president at Oak Ridge High School and will be attending the University of Texas at Austin as an African uh -huh. Diaspora Studies major in the College of Liberal Arts. The opportunities presented to me, full ride scholarship offers, and leadership roles I have been put in the position to receive, I owe greatly to my ability to write, read, and conceptualize. In every English class I've ever taken, which have all been voluntary and at the college level, every student is offered an alternate read and heavily encouraged to read literature and works that they can learn from and thoroughly enjoy. Dystopian literature like Handmaid's Tale and Brave New World, though they are academically advanced work, teach us about the world and society we don't want to live in. They show us the flaw in human behavior and society's view of morality. They critique humanity in such a way that is critical to the advancements of our minds and the ev evolution of our society. I trust my teachers with all my heart to not only give me the academic preparedness for higher education, but the literary freedom that every person, child, or adult should have access to. My beloved English teachers have changed my life and progressed me as a reader far reader and writer far greater than I know my mom and her registered nursing certification could. What she has taught me though is to be someone who seeks out knowledge and someone who doesn't settle for the status quo or bounds and barriers that are constantly placed on young minds, which leads me to pose these questions. To what extent will curriculum would be censored or restricted by district boards and at what point will it not affect our ability to hold academically sound arguments or withstand academically tense environments? What is the board doing to protect the preciousness, the preciousness of Western literature as well as the beauty of self-exploration and expansion of thought and youth? A Brave New World quote that I love. I don't want comfort, I want God, I want poetry, I want real danger, I want freedom, goodness, and sin. We are future leaders of this nation and as an aspiring policymaker of this country, I can proudly say my love and devotion to literature has made me what love where I'm headed even more. Thank you. Justin Dowd. 
How am I supposed to follow that? <laughs> <laughs> Your students are awesome. Good evening, parents, staff, school board. My name is Justin Dowd, and I'm a current senior at College Park, soon to be a proud Cavalier graduate. I've had an amazing experience in CISD and have received a wonderful education that's forged me into the young man I am today. But my CISD education wasn't the only thing that's made me who I am. In addition to my time in theater, choir, and volunteering for a variety of programs, my room is filled with books, my bookshelves overflowing with the excess. I've been an avid reader from an early age, and I followed this board's debate and discussion on books closely. I've watched last month's board meeting, I'm reading the books that have been questioned. I've done everything that I can to enlighten myself, because I believe that's my personal responsibility, just as a parent has a personal responsibility to do what they feel is right for their child. Under the current policy, parents have a right to do just that. They can make decisions for their own child under their own beliefs and preferences. What they do not have a right to do, however, is parent me, or take away my parents' right to allow me to enlighten myself on topics at my own discretion. While I have a remarkable privilege to purchase many of the books I wish to read, it is just that, a privilege. The assertion by some that books can just be ordered off of Amazon by those that wish to read them shows a remarkable disconnect from the financial state of much of our district, and the claim that public libraries offer an alternative to school libraries assumes that every child has transportation to and from said libraries, or the time to visit them during their operating hours, which many do not. That's the point of a school library. We must, I repeat, you must prioritize a child's right to read unencumbered, to discover a book or a topic at random, and to question it further. There is no safer place for exposure than in a book, and meaningful dialogue often sparks from exposure. Knowledge is power, but knowledge also often breeds thought, and thought can breed opposition, which I believe is a large part of why much of this harmful rhetoric as to a child's right to read without a permission slip or some other procedural barrier is being pushed. I'm almost out of time, so I'd like to leave you with a paraphrased quote from Abraham Lincoln. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but make no mistake. This district, this state, and this nation's actions towards the repression of knowledge and the resources to allow it to thrive will go down in history, and I can recall no power that has been regarded in the eyes of the future as heroic for having banned books or knowledge. Can you? Thank you. Aaron Bingham. everybody. Howdy. So I've talked to a lot of CISD educators since November. I've spoken to librarians that like about books and how they view them, English teachers on how they view them, and more so than anything, educators who are terrified to say a word up here for fear that they're going to be retaliated. You will be shocked in those conversations to hear that zero of those Conroe ISD educators are <coughs> pro-porn. Zero of them want your kids gay. Zero of them want your kids to be sexual deviants of any variety. I am tired of watching our district not making progress because they are constantly playing defense to the accusation flavor of the week. The needs of our children are moving at a pace that make it difficult to keep, keep up with in a normal environment, but when you add the layers of multifaceted attacks from a group being fed outrage from a local politician, we have found ourselves paralyzed from making meaningful progress in this district. I am so, t <laughs> I'm so tired of hearing these attacks on our educators. I am tired of some of you sitting in front of me aligning yourselves with those who openly call our educators pro-porn or use their platforms to share articles or posts attacking our teachers for being on a book committee or, God forbid, having a rainbow flag in an elementary school performance. Conroe ISD is not perfect. Teachers are not perfect. No one is saying that it is. But you are all part of allowing a narrative that is dangerous and unproductive to any meaningful conversations toward change and improvement. Your silence to the behavior of those you associate is deafening. Next year, we are going to lose a lot of teachers. I hope Conroe ISDHR has a solid exit interview process in place. The three of you and those that you work with are doing more damage to this district than you can possibly imagine. I want our, educa I want our educators to focus on providing the best possible education in the safest environment for every CIC student, not playing conspiracy theory whack-a-mole. I want a board of trustees who hold the district accountable for excellence. I want trustees who treat the employees of our district with respect that they deserve. I want trustees who work for the interest of my children, not local politicians. And thank you for standing up for our teachers while we still have them. Christy Jamison. Good evening. My name is Christy Jamison. I have been a resident of the Woodlands for about 25 years. I have had three children graduate from the Woodlands High School and a grandchildren currently enrolled. I'm a retired CISD teacher. On an aside, I'd like to thank Dr. Null for his comforting leadership through the lockdown 
and subsequent reopening of our schools. I currently work as a substitute teacher in the district. I am here to address the opt-in, opt-out discussion you were looking at last month. I am in support of staying with the current opt-out plan. The day I register my child in your school district, I am opting in. I am saying I trust you with my baby. I should not have to additionally opt in to different books, curriculum, policy, or whatever you want me to opt in for. I already opted in. I sent my child to your school. I trust the school and the teachers with my child and my child's education. We have had parents opt out of many things in the past. We have had parents opt out of entire music classes, <coughs> holiday celebrations, snack treats, read alouds, for various religious, health, or family reasons. This is all handled with ease and the respect as it should be. Opting out is a well-known policy parents are comfortable with. Registration is opting in. I don't want us to be a part of sending teachers another message that we don't trust them. Thank you. Anne Marie Kennedy. Anne Marie Kennedy. Holly Moore. Hello, members of the board and Dr. Knoll. I heard we were talking about books and book committees. Um, I did bring Girl Scout cookies this time just in case it runs long. I'm going right. to fall into that trap again. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different perspective on this. Um, the CDC conducts a youth risk behavior survey that's released every two years, and they just recently released the um, results from the 2019 to 2021 uh, survey. The survey includes over 17,000 students across the country and asks a variety of questions on a multitude of issues. So just a snapshot of a few things that were re recently released, that currently 18% of females and 22% of LGBTQ youth between 13 and 18 are victims of sexual violence. That's not in another city or another state, that happens here. In addition, 10% of female students and more than 20% of LGBTQ youth, again, 13 to 18 years old, enrolled in public high schools, attempted suicide between 2019 and 2021. The reason I bring this up is that in all of the data that was collected and all the reasons cited by these students for their feelings for what is a mental health crisis for some of our youth, not once was a book ever listed as a cause or a contribution to this crisis. In fact, the recommendations by the CDC for school districts were to strengthen social emotional learning programs, which are simply social emotional learning programs and not associated with any other acronym <coughs> that might be spread on a flow sheet somewhere online on social media. And we already have great things happening in our district. We, ha we have communities and schools. We recently had a university event for parents and families and students. And maybe we can spend some more time talking about these issues because this is a reality for our students and this is something we can address. Books aren't the problem, and they never were. Thank you. Amy Butler. Good evening, Board of Trustees and Dr. Null. My name is Amy Butler, and I'm the mother of two children in Conroe ISD. As a parent of an advanced reader and a certified bookworm, it is very personal to me that, w that our libraries and librarians are under attack. When my child was in second grade, her teacher was worried about her reading books above her grade level. My child com came home every day and complained that she wasn't allowed to read the books that she wanted to read. I had to call the school to get the teacher and the librarian to allow her to read the books in the school library. Because of this experience, I am against having to force parents to opt in to allow children to read books. The opt-out policy is already in place for parents wishing to censor their children. It is not the place of other parents to try to exercise control over and censor the library materials available to my children or to restrict their education. When a section of the Bible about, a section of the Bible about incest was read at the last meeting, 
the trustee said, well, parents can opt out. Parents can opt out if they don't want their children to read these stories. If this policy is good enough for her for these Bible stories, then the opt-out policy does not need to be changed. In addition, if a it is a conflict of interest to have a trustee on the book re reconsideration committees. Um, these committee members should not be intimidated or coerced by a trustee sitting on the committee. You are here to serve all of the students and staff in Connor ISD. It is important to remember that not every child has access to books. Not every child or parent can afford to buy it on Amazon, like I heard often repeated at the last meeting. It shows that you're not in touch with the reality of the situation of some of the students in this district. The library serves a very important purpose in our schools. Studies show that a strong library pro program correlates to high student achievement. Please trust our librarians and teachers to do their jobs and educate our children. Thank you. Thank you. Duncan McGinnis. I had a whole thing written, but after all these young people came up here and showed what good teachers you have in Conroe ISD, I don't need to read it. Um, I'm here um, as a teacher, a fourth generation educator. My great grandfather built a school out of trees for the cut down with his own hands with a sawmill that he used to make the lumber because his kids needed an education. And um, I stand, uh, 37 years ago this summer, I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. And I hold that oath very dearly. And most importantly to me is the First Amendment because I love books. I also love libraries and I love librarians. Um, our librarians, you have invested a tremendous amount of money in beautiful library facilities across this district and hired really good expert librarians to manage it and they do an excellent job curating a collection of books that services our entire student body not just a narrow uh, focus and so I'm just gonna say what I've heard everybody else say here is the so-called censors are not after the books they're after the people who want to read the books they're chasing the kids who are marginalized who don't have an audience who don't have the support that they need and that's not okay and so I stand here, if you need somebody on this committee about reviewing books who can't be intimidated, call me up. I volunteer. <laughs> Paul Laskowski. You and Melanie. <laughs> Good, e Good evening. Uh, thank you, as always, for your time and your service. My children are fortunate to attend schools in Cronor ISD, uh, an excellent school district, as evidenced by the rate at which it is growing. I think third fastest in the state, if I recall. You know, people don't flock to failing school districts. They run from them. So I've been wondering how we ended up with three board members who spent all last year attacking this district. And I think the answer boils down to one word. It's not books. It's vouchers. When the Supreme Court des desegregated public schools in 1954, the American South reacted fiercely, creating segregation academies for white students to be subsidized by public funds in the form of vouchers. Two years later, the Texas governor supported a segregationist Texas voucher program. And though it didn't pass, the drive for vouchers has remained. Today, outspoken voucher advocate and billionaire Betsy DeVos makes significant donations to the American Federation for Children, which through its TFC PAC poured nearly 200 grand into Texas elections last year, including that of Representative Steve Toth. Some of you know him. Meanwhile, Texas billionaires like Tim Dunn and the Wilkes brothers have been buying our state and local politicians through several PACs, which support vouchers and which contributed to the Mama Bears campaign. The decades of voucher rhetoric are now impacting CISD, cloaked as anti-wokeism propped up by scare tactics like pornography in the libraries, anti-white curriculum, and LGBTQ plus grooming, none of which is actually a problem, as you've heard already. These are old fears expressed with new buzzwords. This is not a conservative or liberal problem. This is about our livelihood. If we let the fear mongers drag this district down and shove public funds 
into private and charter schools, people will run from this district, will lose all the teachers, and all of us will suffer. So I'll ask you and the constituents listening, do you want to relive the ignorance of the 1950s, or do you want to create opportunities for our children and our community? Next year, that choice will be yours. Thank you. Hello, Howdy. my name is uh, Louis Pedraza. I live in the uh, in Conroe, and after I had a, not a speech, but I, I was going to talk about the uh, the board review um, item you have under legal. So I, I just want to make sure that on the library policy, we're more transparent in terms of what books are getting into the system. I, for one, will volunteer if we need any kind of help. I also volunteered for the book review committee, and I can't be bothered either, you know. So uh, I, there are conservative people like myself, and all I'm really asking is that you look at different viewpoints. Now, tonight I've listened to a lot of different speeches and talk, but what I find really interesting is that it's all from a segmented <coughs> group of people, younger people, teachers. I talk to parents, many, many parents. I go door to door, I work the election, and I, I think I spoke to over 100 people, 100 parents. A lot of them were very concerned with what is happening in the school districts. Some of them pulled their kids out and they said, I'm not letting my kids go to school here, okay? And reality, you know, this guy just talked about um, funding and Soros, well, he didn't say Soros, but Soros has something to do with it too. Uh, in terms of funding the other side, so uh, I guess what I'm getting at is the parents expressed a really, really deep desire to, for a change. And that's why the last election happened the way it happened. And future elections are going to happen the way they happen. I can't uh, predict that. I can't tell you what's going to happen. But I can tell you there are a lot of dissatisfied parents, taxpayers and parents. Maybe they're not the same as school teachers and students, but they are concerned parents. And that's all I really have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amber Fusca. Tomorrow marks the one year anniversary of our due process ruling. Just so it's clear why I continue to show up here. I have a few excerpts from the decision of the hearing officer as well as her conclusion on the law. In this case, the appropriateness of students' educational environment is the only factor clearly favoring the district. Despite passing marks, the weight of credible evidence showed student made limited academic process in an identified area of need. Students' achievement scores over time demonstrate continued deficits in basic reading skills and reading fluency that are lower than would be expected given students' cognitive abilities and despite several years of general education dyslexia intervention. <coughs> the conclusion, the district failed to identify student as a student with autism under IDEA. The district procedurally violated IDEA by failing to evaluate student in all areas of suspected disability. The district violated IDEA and provision of FAPE by failing to appropriately consider ESY services. The district violated state regulations by restraining student in the absence of a behavioral emergency. The student was denied FAPE during the relevant time period. The student's IEP was not reasonably calculated to address the student's needs in light of student's unique circumstances. I want to make it clear, I have never said nor do I think we have a teacher problem in our district. On the whole, we do have amazing teachers in our district but something is causing kids that should be receiving services to not qualify. The issue is not isolated to a single school or feeder, and it's predominantly affecting dyslexia and ASD kids. I know how kids are being disqualified in our district. The hearing officer noted in our case, a preponderance of the evidence showed that the district's FIE was not sufficiently comprehensive, and its conclusion student did not meet eligibility criteria was not supported by its own data. Moreover, the result could contradicting the finding that student did not meet eligibility criteria. 
Further, in determining students eligibility, the LSSP attributed students significant social deficits to cognitive distortion but did not assess cognitive distortion and this conclusion was reached without data to support it. What I haven't figured out is why. Has the district decided these kids aren't worth the return on investment? In the last month, I've seen action taken by a majority thank of the you. board. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. I was going to thank you. Well, no. <laughs> I just, we got it. Rachel Walker. I'm trying to be consistent. Good evening, board. President Hubert, Dr. Knoll. <clears throat> um, books, well, hold on. Unless I'm only 5'3, I'm not working with all of you. Okay. Books are often referred to as windows. They allow the reader to peer into a different time, place, and experience from the safety of their home, classroom, or library. But books are also mirrors. They can reflect back to the reader their own culture and life experiences. Representation in classroom reading materials is incredibly important. Every student deserves to be able to identify with the stories that are being read to them and the ones they are reading independently. Historically, banned or challenged books target stories of marginalized people groups. Studies have shown that when children do not have reading material that is representative and inclusive, they struggle to feel accepted. They feel shame about their culture or the differences in their families, and there is a direct negative impact in the way they relate to their classmates. There are students in CISD right now with two moms. There are students with two dads. There are students who have transgender parents. There are students who worship differently than their peers, or the kind of food that they eat at home or bring in their lunches is different, and it doesn't look like their classmates. Those kids deserve to see themselves reflected back in the pages of a book. Deciding which books stay on the shelves based on our own values or narrow worldviews is a danger to the mental health of our students. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. It's why I wear this pin everywhere I go. The statistics for transgender youth, it's 82% of them contemplate suicide and 40% of them actually attempt suicide. If you're a parent and you're looking at your transgender child and you're thinking there's an 82% chance that you have contemplated suicide. That is terrifying. That precious student over there deserves to see themselves reflected back in their reading materials. It's not okay to take those away. So I just want to thank you for your time and your continued support of all of our students. Thank you. <laughs> Carolyn Nini. Good evening. When God was expelled from our schools in the 1960s is when the experiences of our youth became immeasurably devastating. Suicide is now the second leading cause of death among children. Over 5,000 commit, er, commit suicide every year. That's more than 13 per day. Child Protective Services claim there is a sexual assault on a teenager every eight minutes. They estimate 540 assaults happen <coughs> daily. The number of abortions among teenage girls is staggering. It amounts to 719 per day and over 260 million per year. 10 million sexually transmitted diseases and infections occur among the youth yearly. The United States is ranked as the worst nation in the world for human trafficking. According to Health and Human Services, our population is under greater risk of sexual exploitation. Eric Hesnick, a Stanford economist did a study on the learning loss of students since COVID. He reports there, are, there will be at least $28 trillion loss to our, our economy in the near future. His study also indicates the academic loss will amount to each individual losing 70,000 lifetime earnings as well. These stagger, staggering statistics can no longer be ignored. If we continue down this path with current educational failures and the moral decay of our children, there will be no hope for the future of our nation. It's going to be an overwhelming job to turn this ship around. However, CISD has the ability to do so, uh, uh, to, to do something about, about it by being the first district to take action to be an example for our other schools. Be that shining school on the hill. Be the first school district to remove the sexually immoral books from our schools and start a curriculum program that will give our students a proper education and a better chance at life. Thank you. 
educator in CISD for 13 years now. For the first 10 years, this was the greatest career, district, and county to work in. Because for my first decade, the educators, parents, and community members were partners. It used to be that parents would reach out directly to the teachers or librarians with any concerns, and they would work out a solution where both parties would feel respected. But there's no partnership anymore. We have organizations and individuals that have put a target on educators in Montgomery County. Groups that encourage the, I gotcha. We have groups that have pushed the divide between our teachers and the community to its breaking point. Groups that encourage harassment, distrust, and just downright meanness to public educators. These people have created such a volatile community environment for myself and my fellow educators that we are considering for the first time in our decades long careers, leaving education. I want you to think about who your target is public educators and school librarians. People who owe more in student loans than they make in a yearly salary. We are your neighbors. We shop at the same grocery stores as you. Our children play together. We even sit next to you at church. Except we missed the sermon on if you love Jesus, you should attack public educators so much that they want to leave their career that they've dedicated their whole lives to. We must have been grading papers on that particular Sunday. <laughs> We beg you to get this partnership back on track, Montgomery County. Stop creating the I gotcha moments, and instead, talk to us. Work with us. If it continues like this, this board will need to start planning for a ton of vacancies. Because in all of my 13 years, I've never seen so many friends and coworkers throughout this entire district updating their LinkedIn accounts. And who can blame us? Retention bonuses do not pay for the loss of respect, distrust, and harassment that we are feeling. Susan Scruggs. Good evening, school board and Dr. Null. Um, I wanted to talk about library books tonight, and I am not a uh, censorship person. I don't want to burn books. I want the books that you have in your libraries to be legal. And uh, I don't know if you saw this today, but there was a big sting operation in Texas uh, where 59 people were arrested for child porn, and, and some of your books that I've seen in the library are considered pornography according to the penal code 43.24. I highly, uh, I, look, I look up to your librarians, I look up to your teachers, I think you have high academics and I think you've achieved so much in this school district that I don't want this to bring your school district down. These people were arrested for having child porn, for having pornography, for distributing it. The penal code says the sale, distribution, display of harmful material to a minor is illegal. It's against the law. And some of the books that you have in your library are against the law. I would like you to look into those, that you would evaluate which books meet this penal code and get rid of them. If somebody wants against the law books, they can get them from Amazon, public libraries, anywhere else. They don't need to be in a safe space. And uh, the, the top thing on this article, it says the innocence of children must be protected at all cost. And I'd like to read you a quote from the Bible. Jesus said in Luke 17, a person who causes even one of my little followers to sin would be better off thrown into the ocean with a millstone tied around their neck. And if you haven't seen what one looks like, they're 500 to 3,300 pounds. And this would be a very dreadful thing. Thank you. You're welcome. John Bednar.
Good evening. My name is Dawn Bednars, and I'm here tonight to speak to you about our children so that you'll take responsibility for their development and do the right thing to provide a safe, nurturing environment for all of our children. Federal law strictly prohibits the distribution of obscene matter to minors and any transfer or attempt to transfer obscene material to a minor. Obscenity is not protected under the First Amendment rights to free speech and a violations of federal obscenity laws are a criminal offense. Kind of makes you wonder, this attempt to transfer applies to the people speaking in favor of keeping obscene pornographic materials in our schools. The Oxford Classical Dictionary defines pornography as the explicit representation of sexual activity in images or writing. Marion Webster says the meaning of pornography is a depiction of erotic behavior, as in pictures or writing, intended to call sexual excitement. <laughs> Let's say that um, they all somehow they got into our library. Maybe they just they won an award from some New York publisher, and on that basis alone, they were purchased by librarians, shelved and distributed for our children. Somewhere, somebody dropped the ball. Now we must remove them or be held accountable for their presence. These materials are, uh, are not just obscene, they are pornographic. They depict minors performing sexual acts, some with each other, some with adults. Now pedophilia laws are also maybe in play. You are the school board. Don't give your authority to some New York publisher. You have the authority to remove public pornographic books from our libraries. You have the authority to approve purchasing new books, leaving out the pornography. I am not asking you to ban books or to burn them. Just remove them from our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy Gallion. Kathy Gallion. She's coming. She's Sorry. coming. No, no, Kathy Gallion. Sorry. Yeah, she's coming. Well, I was supposed to go after Tina, but um, I'm here tonight. I heard a lot of good presentations, a lot of passion. Would you mind getting close? A lot Thank of passion you. in the presentations tonight. I understand that uh, people want to work together, and I, the people that I work with, are very willing to work with the name callers. We're not going to call names because there's no place in it. This, as Susan said, these items in your school libraries, some of them are pornographic. Not all of them. Books are great. We love to read. We understand that reading opens up minds and makes it, it students identify with it. They will identify with the pornography as well. And that can cause all kinds of rotten, rotten effects. Uh, underdeveloped regions of the brain as educators that is a this is a faulty product you are in the business of building brains it can cause high anxiety cause aggressive behavior which kids are seeing on a daily basis at school in some places isolation this is addiction of any kind Addic addiction to pornography sex drugs pedophilia suicide I personally have experienced four in my career as a teacher, over the 30 years that I taught, four in the last five years, none in the first 25. What's happening? It's time we gotta take a better stance on what we're doing. Be responsible, do the right thing. I know our librarians are value, are, they're hard to find. They're valuable. Our teachers are incredible, I get that. We don't wanna pass the buck and put it on all of them. We need to take responsibility and do our jobs and get rid of the bad ones. Not every book is bad. There are plenty of wonderful books out there, and there are, with the talent that our librarians have, they can choose books that contain the issues students need without the porn. There are out there. Thank you. Thank you. Tina Orball. Tina Orball.
Hi. Howdy. I'm Tina Orba, and I've taught for 33 years. So the last thing in the world I'd want to do is attack a teacher. I adore teachers. I love teaching. That would be the last thing in the world I'd want to do. Um, but I do have a concern, uh, and that is about the books. Um, if you take a look at children, children, if they are exposed to this early in life, it does something to their brain. Their frontal lobe is not developed, and when it's not developed and they see this stuff, they can't forget it, especially reading, because reading your mind just keeps going, and uh, it definitely is very effective. We're not here to say, hey, we are against you people, or we're against you people. We're not against anybody. And when you say we people attack, I don't know who those people are. You don't give any names. You're just saying people are attacking teachers. I don't think we're attacking teachers. We just want you to educate our kids the way they should be. Okay? The toxic effects upon children are often lifelong. Pornographic descriptions are illegal for a reason because effects such as underdeveloped regions of the brain, anxiety, aggressive behavior, isolation, addictions to pornography, sex, drugs, pedophilia, suicide, risky behavior, desensitization, de desensitization, uh, and tendency to rape. These are all possible if they are see things they're not supposed to see as a young kid. That's the reason when you go to a movie, there's an R-rated movie, because the younger kids can't handle it. I have a seven-year-old grandchild. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a seven-year-old grandchild. Quickly, just to say that um, she gets scared watching some movies. So they're not appropriate for her. And the same with these books. And I think you all got... You all are up there Great. because the public wanted you up there. Thank you. Terry Bonin. There she is. I hope to give you all a reprieve. You have voluntarily put yourself on the butcher block, and I acknowledge that and respect you. Um, the Bible's quoted a lot around here. You noticed? Um, I want to give you some encouragement. Real quickly, hold on, let me find my notes. Um, I think it's important to take the word at the whole counsel of God. Not just we can pick any side and find a scripture to fit our what we want, right? But ultimately, um, we answer to a higher power. So here are my encouraging words. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Matthew 24:35. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. Piercing, it divides the soul and, and from spirit, joints from marrow, is able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Every word of God is pure, and he is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Um, I encourage all to get on the same page. Put your trust in the whole counsel of God. God is not a God of confusion. And um, when you find yourselves trying to make a decision on something, and you're all at odds, and there's confusion in the room, just stop and understand that pause. God is not, he's not a God of confusion and there are answers and you can't get on the same page. So um, those of us who are in positions of leadership, especially over children, are held at a, um, a higher degree of responsibility before God. I take that so, I take that so personally kind of scary. And so I just want to remind you that you have a group of people who are praying for you. I, I represent a lot of parents who value what you do, and pray for you specifically. So thank you so much. Thank you. Seraphim Farias. Seraphim Farias. Patty. Board, Dr. Nell, uh, everyone here. Uh, this speech is, is really for parents, people in this room, people interested. So the school board is kind of aware uh, as to what I'm going to talk about. It's about reading. Um, 
uh, and how, yeah, teaching children how to read. So what's the most important skill our school teaches our kids? Uh, it's reading, right? I mean, that's the, the, the most important thing, I believe, that, that the school district teaches our kids. Now, is Connor ISD teaching our kids the best way to read today? It's called the science of reading. There's been a lot of research, and the science of reading is basically uh, the best way to teach children that we've found. Right now, we, we teach balanced literacy in the district. We're trying to get to science of reading. Okay, so I'm going to give you an analogy. Let's say your family have three kids. Okay, the first, you're, right to, you're going to teach them to ride a bike. First kid, you do okay with. You make mistakes. Second kid, you start teaching them to ride a bike. You make a fewer mistakes, all right, and you, you get it a little bit better. The third kid, you get it. All right, you know how to teach the kid how to ride a bike. Okay, so that's what's happening with Conrad ISD in our reading. We're right now Conrad ISD teaching about a one and a two, maybe more towards two because we made some good changes. But the three is where we need to get to. It's called science of reading. You're saying why is that important? Why is that important to teach the kids the right way to read? Okay, so if we teach like a one and two, you got a hundred kids. You got 50 of them that are going to learn how to read well. You got 50 of them that are going to struggle. Okay, uh, they're, they're still going to learn, many of them will, but it's a 50-50. Now, if you go to science of reading, you get a 90-10 split, all right? So you get 90 kids out of 100 that learn how to read. It's teaching them the right way, and you get 10 of them that you can focus on and get them to read well. So what the board, this is for the board now, okay, what needs to happen? We need to create a subcommittee. Okay, with administrators, teachers, and we need to get the curriculum for reading looked at. Let them do the work, okay? You don't have to do it. Let the subcommittee do the work, and we'll get us to where we need to be. Thank you, sir. Linda Long. I'm still here, yes. From, <laughs> you, you know I'm going to talk about thinking, right? You know that. So I already, you probably got that memorized from my last five times I've been here. But it is very important. Um, when I, I was a busy day and I came home and realized this tonight. Okay, I'm going to go there. So I looked up some things. And so when he's talking about, I heard him talking about the reason teachers are leaving. I don't know the reasons. All of them are leaving, but I know some reasons. So, and I was reading in here the PISA, you know, how, the, how our reading is here in in America as a whole, and it kind of startled me. But I'm not, I think I won't talk about that now. I want to tell you something about that, because I've been talking so much about the books tonight, when, and it's so important. I, several years ago, my, my grandparents all came from Norway. My, my grandmother, who was 90-some years old, when I came home one time to South Dakota, she said, Linda, I, I, just, I just can't read the Old Testament anymore. <laughs> I said, oh, really? No, it's just too much killing in there. <laughs> That's okay, Grandma, you don't have to read it. I know you've read it before. And I'm telling you to say that this, because we talked about the Bible, and there's things in there that are bad. Absolutely. But one thing about the Bible, it is true. I gave you that scripture a lot of times, twice already, I think. John 17, 17. <laughs> Thy word is truth. So that is truth. So what I want to do, I found this quote maybe, uh, maybe uh, two, several years ago. I took a picture of it just before I came. This is Martin Luther King, of course, if you're Norwegian, you're Lutheran. So I'm Luther. Here's what he said, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther the King, excuse me, Martin Luther, the head of the Reformation. He said, I hear, this is a powerful statement, and I've had it in my purse for so long. I am much afraid that the universities will prove to be the great gates to hell unless they diligently labor to explain the Holy Scriptures and to engrave them upon the hearts of youth. I advise no one to place their child where the Scriptures do not reign paramount. It's pretty powerful. Every institution where men are not unceasingly occupied with the word of God must become corrupt. I tell you that word of God, I love it. I won't go to bed without reading it. I made that vow when I was like 10 years old. And that actually makes me, that's what makes me, it's true. And it makes me love everybody. Honestly, I really do. And I, I really do. So I love you guys and thanks for what you do. Thank you. Robert LaBelle. Hello, I'm just having a hard time hearing everybody back there. But anyway, I'd like to start out by saying there is a lot of good 
here at CISD. We had some of it at the very beginning here, coming through here. I've seen some of it in the schools. There are some good teachers and some, some good things out there. However, there are some glaringly bad things. And I'll just start out here just listening to what's going on here. If you go to the movies, they have ratings. G, PG, PG-13, depending how old you are, how mature you are, what you're able to see and view. That's exactly what we're talking about, the library books. And people say, oh, we need to give all this uh, pornographic stuff to the kids. No. One lady here was talking about uh, how it develops, you know, a young brain doesn't need to see this garbage. And that's true. I've got, uh, well, I've got six kids myself. I've got two grandkids. And my two grandkids are now in CISD, uh, just starting out. So I am very concerned about this. They need to be taught well. Uh, now, one of the people here back here said that they trusted you. I do not trust you. CISD spent, I don't know how many, hundreds of dollars sending librarians to a drag show. There is no such thing as a family-friendly drag show. Uh, so that's where I see your morals are at. And that's what you're trying to teach these kids. And you're trying to indoctrinate the teachers and librarians in our school by sending them to a drag show. So I, I, I do not trust you at all. Uh, and this all-inclusiveness you try to push on everybody. Really? We have prisons that are full of people that we do not want to include in society. We do not be all-inclusive. I mean, you include serial rapists? Is that going to be all-inclusive and you're inclusive of everything? I hope not. If it is, you need to get away from my kids. Um, there are moral standards, and they need to be abided by. And i got plenty more here, but why? Thank you. That's the last one. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to take a, a, a quick re is Dr. Knoll, is there anything that you want to address about a, a drag show? that we did not attend or send anybody to? We, we did not send, we did not send anybody to, to any show. kind of no, drag show, so it's nice try. Um, but we, we, will, we will go ahead and have a quick, quick recess. Uh, but before I do, I want to be mindful of Ms. Puska. If I was too quick, I apologize. I'll be mindful of that next week or next time. Short recess. Thank you, Jesus.
All right, we are back in session. Time is 8.07. Moving on to item four, which is our consent agenda. I have not heard from anybody to remove anything. Mr. We have President, a motion. I make a motion that we accept the consent agenda as presented. Right. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor shall be uplifted hand. Any opposed by the same side? Motion carries. Thank you. All right, moving on to item five, human resources. Uh, name assistant superintendent for middle schools, <coughs> Dr. Knoll. All right, thank you, President Hubert. Uh, as you know, we um, have had a little bit of the domino effect that occurs uh, when we have uh, folks retire or get promoted. And we had a situation where Dr. Hines is gonna be retiring at the end of the year. Uh, and Dr. Medford has been named as his replacement. So that has left us now with the vacancy for the assistant superintendent for middle schools. And this is a, a particularly important position because uh, they oversee our intermediates and junior highs, which are two significant transitions uh, and uh, an area that we see um, an academic fall off potentially between intermediate and junior high. So we work hard to prevent that. And that's why this position uh, is structured the way it is. So this is a, a role that uh, is very valuable to our school district. Uh, as we listen to our principals, give feedback as to what they needed in this person, as well as the interview committees that went through the processes, uh, wanted somebody that uh, had experiences uh, in a lot of varied areas throughout our school district uh, and uh, had served in, in many different situations. And we found that uh, in our person that I'll make the recommendation for tonight. Um, I will be recommending for you Dr. Jeff Stickler. Dr. Stickler is the current principal at Caney Creek High School. But prior to that, he was the principal of Moorhead Junior High. Uh, and prior to that, Conroe High School ninth grade campus, an associate principal at Conroe High School, an assistant principal at College Park High School, and an assistant principal at Moorhead Junior High. So he served as an administrator uh, for, for uh, over 15 years in Conroe ISD, three different feeder zones. Um, both in areas of affluence and in areas of high um, economically disadvantaged student populations has been very successful. And there's a lot of things you could say about uh, Dr. Stickler and his, uh, as far as his intelligence and his ability to know curriculum and run great schools, but far and away above any of that is the fact that he is a fine man with a giant heart. And uh, I think that that will serve our campus is very well, so I'm proud to make the recommendation of Dr. Jeff Stickler to be our assistant superintendent for middle schools. All right, do we have a motion? Mm -hmm. Mr. Move President, I move that we appoint Dr. Jeff Stickler, assistant superintendent for middle schools. Second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? My one question is you go from Dr. Bedford, uh, is there a height requirement? Yeah, it's a. <laughs> We occasionally campuses will have student uh, or faculty basketball games. I'm trying to amass in case we ever get invited. Uh, I want to make sure we have a squad. That's why. I'm really fair enough. Fair enough. Just All don't right. call uh, the superintendent little man anymore. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I call the vote. All those in favor, show by the uplifted hand. And any opposed by the same sign. Congratulations. <laughs> President Hubert, members of the board, Dr. Null, I want to start by thanking you for this wonderful opportunity. As Dr. Null said, I've been a part of Conroe ISD for 24 years. I've been married for 25. I was telling my wife the other day, I'm not planning on leaving either one. I have worked in East County, North County, and South County, and I can truly say that this is the best district in the state. I am so excited to get a chance to work with many principals that I know and admire, but have never been blessed to work directly with them. I'm ready for this role and looking forward to see the growth and success of this district for years to come. I would like to thank my sweet wife, Melanie. She is my hero and inspiration. My two children, Cullen and Kylie. They have loved and supported me, made me so proud of all that I've accomplished. I want to thank Dr. Knoll for his advice and suggestions over the years as they helped me, helped make me the administrator I am today. 
I also want to thank we have someone here, Ms. Gail Drummond, a former assistant superintendent. She was also my eighth grade reading teacher in Fort Stockton, <laughs> Texas. <laughs> Love seeing her here. I want to thank Dr. Tasha Smith, Dr. Upshaw, Dr. Taylor, Dr. Merle, and countless others for the invaluable advice, mentorship, and information they have freely given me over the years. Of course, I want to thank the administrative team, the faculty, staff, and students of Caney Creek High School for allowing me to grow, be patient, being patient with me, and for grinning and bearing it when I say my dad jokes each week on the announcements. <laughs> Again, thank you for trusting me with this responsibility. I understand the importance of it, and I will strive daily to do what is best for these students, families, teachers, and administrators of Conroe ISD. Thank you. All right. Congratulations, indeed. Now, now your work begins for a new principal. That's, that's right. <laughs> Next domino. There it is. That's right. That's right. All right. Uh, if it pleases the board, I'd like for us to consider moving up item 11, which is legal. I know we've had quite a few people in attendance that are here for that. And um, if it's all right, we'd like to. I don't see any objections. Is it okay if we move that up? Okay. Very good. Moving to item 11A, which is receive information regarding local policy manual update 120 and revision to board policy DC employee practice, DEC compensation benefits, leaves and absence, FFAC wellness and health services, medical treatment and GKD community relations, non-school use of facilities, and GKDA non-school use of school facilities, distributions of non-school literature, and anything else that we can fit into that, <laughs> that title. Right. <clears throat> Ms. Gladys. Ms. Gladys. So tonight is the first reading. You know, if you could pull your microphone. Oh, sorry. Gladys, thank reminder you. to all the board that you, you have a two-reading uh, two policy, and so this is the first reading for update 120 and the local policies that we're including with that update. Update 120 primarily uh, contains uh, modifications to legal policies brought on by updates to the Texas Administrative Code from the last legislative session. It also contains several local policies, which you'll find um, is explained below and I'll run through. And then we also included several policies that we've been holding for the update to make recommendations to you to uh, modify. Uh, the first policy included in this uh, local policy is the BBB board member elections. Um, the recommendation is that we change, you know, we use the terminology position, that we change it to seat so it is less confusing uh, to the electorate, and then also update our years of election cycle as we've cycled through all of those. And so that's the update to BBB. CKC is a requirement that's been added by the administrative code uh, that we include terrain derailments in our emergency operations plan. We have been doing that. We just didn't have it in our policy, and so this makes that modification. Okay. DEC is a change that we're bringing to you. We would like to uh, we recommend to the board that we, the board grant Dr. Null permission to hire teachers and uh, coordinator levels on down during the summer months. Uh, I think we are, uh, what did we say, March through the end of summer so that we can get those folks hired before other districts do. We experienced some issues with that last summer, losing folks uh, because we couldn't hire them as quickly as uh, others could. In D.C., we're, we did some cleanup in that policy. You know, we've added the provision about being able to bank roll or bank uh, leave days, and we needed to do a little tweaking, and that's what those changes have been recommended in that one primarily relate to. Um, in FFAC, uh, we need to have a policy that allows us to uh, purchase and keep the um, antagonist medication for fentanyl, and so this makes us compliant with that law by adding this language to that policy. FNG are just some minor tweaks to make sure that it's clear that complaints falling under uh, various other laws like IDEA Section 504 or uh, free and reduced lunches do not fall under FNG. They are directed to other complaint policies and compliance with those laws that dictate those. FO student <coughs> discipline contains a requirement brought on by the administrative code relating to uh, um, uh, restraints of students in special education. That language has been added. 
At GKD, we're recommending that support groups, under our current policy, uh, support groups get two free events at a campus each year for fundraising and other purposes. Uh, we're asking that this be expanded to give the superintendent authority to make uh, exception or a add to that if the circumstances warrant to allow other support groups to have beyond perhaps the two free events um, to raise funds or provide support to staff or events for families and students at school. And then finally, GKDA DA is the policy that deals with distribution of non-school literature on district property. Uh, we would like to explicitly exclude uh, campaigning material, as you know, that's not allowed under state law. And while we thought the, the, the policy is currently written, does will make it explicit so there are no questions, and that's what that change uh, currently is. So next month in March, we'll bring these policies back to you on the local ones for adoption. Um, if you have any questions in the meantime or tonight, you're free, free to, to um, post them to me. We're voting on this next, next month? Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. Any questions at this time? All right, very good. Moving on. Thank you, Ms. Gladys. Appreciate that. Uh, moving on to 11B, review and consider amending board policy EFB local instructional resources library material. So this is something that we we talked about last month. Um, and to, to, to kind of get it started, I thought what we would we could start with is uh, maybe go around and, and kind of give your thoughts in, in a bit of a summary, and then uh, move to have a motion that we can that we can we can then open up for discussion on a particular motion. Uh, just to kind of kick it off, I know we all got an email back on February 14th. Some were out on Valentine's and Dr. Noel was working. Uh, so said we have been we have been working to find solutions to address the concerns each of you have expressed as well as concerns that we have heard from different factors of our community relating to library books. We listened mm -hmm. to the comments each of you made during a January board meeting, comments made by the public, and met with our librarians. So based on the information, we put away a couple of things. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just a couple of them. Number one, our staff, including librarians, want to cultivate a variety of appropriate collections in our library that reflect our student body. Number two, everyone believes that parents should retain the ultimate decision-making authority for their own child. Number three, we have had some books in our libraries that have clearly not met the board's selected criteria and should never have been in our libraries at all. They have been removed, and if others are found, they will be removed. And, and the fourth one I'll read is, there are other books that some find objectable while others do not. This is where the conversation becomes more, di more difficult. So as it was pointed mm -hmm. out, the Board of Trustees is responsible for setting policy and administration it was, is responsible for setting the, pro the procedure to implement the Board's policies. So I just wanted to kind of open that up and, and, and just remind us that um, Everybody seems to be working towards a solution. The librarians, um, they want to work with the solution. They want to be able to provide um, opportunities for the students to, to, uh, to read books, to, to do all the things that they need to do, and um, certainly leave the decision making to the parents uh, for what they feel is right for their children and that they also recognize that there are some books in the libraries that have been deemed inappropriate based upon the criteria that we have given and they're combing through and finding those books and pulling them them out on their own um, so i just wanted to kick it off that way and then allow all of us an opportunity to, to, to speak and then certainly uh, have a motion to see if there's if there's a motion that we can discuss as well so i turn it over to you uh, i would just like to start out by um I'm looking at, and forgive me, I'm new here, but um, I see that the policy was updated in August of 2022, um, but uh, TEA came out with some updated minimum guidelines in April of 2022, so I'm just wondering um, why we chose uh, the particular policy that you guys voted on versus starting with the uh, updated guide guidelines that Mike Morath brought out with the TEA in April. You guys know? Uh, right. In there, I believe, right? Well, we, right. We, we incorporated some of the ideas in that. That was a suggestion. It wasn't a mandate from the commissioner. Right. He just, you know, compiled various thoughts from... Yeah, it's very know. different. I was just curious, like, how it was put together. 
Well, it was put together by the board. Like we, we're the ones that write the policy, and TEA gives us a guideline, and then we know right. our students and our librarians better, and so we, we put together a policy. It was kind of driven um, through us, and we mm -hmm. made some suggestions. Okay. When you compare the two skeletal current board policy that was described last month as vague, um, gray areas, ambiguity, um, they, were, they were unclear. Those were all terms used during last month's lengthy meeting. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have, that's because our policy as it stands right now is so skeletal. It is so undefined and what TEA set forth in April that we barely touched on in our district's policy, we really need to address now. I mean, that's why we ended up in the situation we were last month is that we kept uh, so many hours because we kept going over the ambiguity, the unclear, the and things such as that that put us in that position. I'm, really kind of surprised at when I was told that the district was working on revisions that what we got back was so minimal. Um, but I was surprised that the district was working on one. I didn't think of them as working on one because that's our job is to come up with the things that we set as the standards. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was glad we got something because I didn't expect that, but um, until a, a communication that I had, but um, there's almost no, there's so few changes to even, I mean, we've, we have a lot of work ahead of us, and that's why I presented the board with um, a proposal of amendments. Okay. So. Thank you for that. Anybody else? I would echo that, of course, but you say, Peter, you were aware of the guidelines that were released last or last April. Did, did y'all compare this to this policy before you adopted it back in August of 22? Um, we, you're asking me to recall something back in April in this summer, and there's been so much that has happened since then. I, I, I can't, uh, I can't remember everything, um, but I know that I, I'm. If you could help me understand what you're getting at, tell me what you're trying to get at. So what Misty was saying, um, looking through this, I think it's a five page, maybe six page policy that was created back in August. It, it literally touches on maybe half of the, of the suggestion that they released just a few months prior in, within all of the hype about the libraries and the selection. So it, it's very surprising, like was mentioned, that um, certain things were left off. I don't, I don't know if that was um, the intention, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of material in the suggested um, example. It's just an example, but there's a lot here that could have kept us from where we ended up last month. If, if I may clarify, perhaps um, our policy until um, the kind of the, the interest in library books occurred had worked very well for many, <laughs> many, many years. And um, the really, the ambiguity, the only ambiguity we discussed last month was whether a school board member yes. could sit on the Can committee on the or committee. not. Otherwise, right. there have not been ambiguity. issues with this. Well, no, policy. last month we brought up the opt in, opt out. Um, Y'all did. Well, we did, yeah. and it's not its not fully, uh, I mean, it, it, there's so much missing here as far Because as it wasn't something the board entertained previously yeah. about opting in or out, it wasn't. But these, and the selection that, you know, the curious part, my, my personal curiosity was that um, the board's not mentioned in this policy as having authority over. It's your policy. But it's, it's not even, mentioned that the board has authority over selection and approval. What would you expect? That it be mentioned in the, in the policy, just for clarification, what? because that's not, I think. Um, the board has authority over every policy. Correct. 
But we we but abdicated when we go a lot. For an hour back and forth about decisions that are being made based on a policy, it would have helped if if just the full con the full text well, would have been included sorry, in the <coughs> so if I could um, make sure I'm understanding you would like the board to approve every book that is purchased? No. Well no because that's I'm mis then I'm misunderstanding it's my understanding that it's the policy that, that, you that would when like purchases us to do are that. made it comes before the board for approval. So is every right? book. Yeah, so you would want us to approve every single book, every every single thing that we purchase, you want us to actually look at it, read it, and then approve it. At least offer the information for review, like we do with all other things, you know, when we're purchasing a furniture for a school or athletic. I mean, at least, yes, put the information, give it to us. If you don't want to look at it, that's so fine. No, no, no. So, so why no. hire a professional librarian? What is, what is the point well, of them? Well, ultimately, if this actually included a little more about how the selection process should go and, and what the criteria are, then we likely wouldn't have any issues if those were followed. So you're stating that we're not following a policy for choosing and selecting books. There's a reason that books that are that have been removed were in their library. So I, I'm assuming that. I don't like to assume. I'm just mm. moving forward. What can we do to avoid where we? We it's have because been. we've had an unclear policy on what how we're choosing those books, and that's what we need to get straight to begin with. We need to, we don't have a set criteria for how to choose these books. We don't have a set rubric or a set um, standard. I mean, it's been uh, basically the as I was as it was stated to me, the standard has been: does it have library award? Does it have book awards? Does it have a resource behind it like the ALA, the American Library Association? And we've already seen that many of those rankings are just a way of putting things forward that don't necessarily align with our standards. Mm -hmm. And so I think that what we need to do now is to look at several of the things that were pointed out in my policy um, suggestions as how we could set forth better parameters so we don't end up with these books in our libraries to begin with and to help with the removing of the ones that don't meet our standards as was stated last month. Mr. President, will you entertain a motion? Yes, that's what I was just going to ask. Would we, Mr. Could President, we I propose enough? that we reject the district's proposal of changing the current policies and any policy that limits access to our school library. Again, my proposal that the board is that the board take no action on our current policy. Second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? So, Dr. Knoll, do we not have any policy for selecting books? Yeah, there's a selection criteria there's listed selection in the criteria. policy. Mm -hmm. yes. And then state law, if you look at EFB legal, it sets out what the law is on selection of books. And administrative code section requires that we use the school library program standards and guidelines for Texas when we com compose our collections. And the education code section 33.021 requires that we consider those standards by that commission. And those are the ones that are articulated within your policy, the 16 or the 15 uh, criteria set up by the Texas State Library. And they're very subjective and they're very broad and they've also been updated in the TEA, um, the Texas Education Agency, and um, been brought forward with new standards in the, the policy uh, or the information that Mike Morass put out in April. But isn't his isn't his isn't what he puts out just a suggestion as an independent school district we have the ability to choose absolutely exactly. and we've chosen to do very little I don't believe that's true I think we put a lot of faith and trust into our librarians who don't pick books willy-nilly they they look uh, at at many selections to decide what is great for their own individual campus. So I want to make sure that we. Um, I'm not. I'm not speaking that. against the librarians. I'm speaking based on the criteria that they're being given and having to make subjective decisions, and that's not fair to them. We're putting a lot of liability, legal liability, on them, and that's not fair to them. 
Well, which books are considered pornography? Which ones have gone through some sort of legislation and have been labeled pornography? It's not for legislation. Oh, well, let me ask you no, this. No, 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 no. It is. It is. It, let it, me ask it, you it this. It must have gone through some sort of court case or some sort of guidance that it is pornography. Which ones have done that that we're looking to remove or we're looking to deal with? Which ones have been brought which forth? Ones what? Which books? Which books that we're so upset about have been brought forth in a court case and labeled pornography with a, a decision, a judge's decision? Which ones? What does that have to do with what we're discussing? Because you're stating that that we can't have them. They're illegal. They're pornography. That we are bringing up. You know, we're bringing books in that are violating statutes, but we don't have anything that stated. That it's been violated. So I, I want to make I want to make so sure. So you that want me to give you a list of books that, that have a court case and a judge ruling stating that they're pornography. Which ones? Pornography, as you know, is defined by your community values. So therefore, we are talking about Conroe ISD and what court cases do we have in Conroe ISD? I would venture to bet none. Mr. President, in not at this time. And so then, whose values the are not being met? I actually we call the vote. Uh, We're still discussing. I'd like for it to continue. Yeah. If that's okay. And if we're gonna continue, we're gonna continue. I know we're gonna continue because it's mm -hmm. it's important to take this thing because I've got some. I have some thoughts as I well. Like but to I would like out. We do have a list. One second. So Brett Ligon does not support our community values. He is our he. You know he is the one. He's our DA. He brings up court cases. So he does not support our community values. Those generally, I'm not saying that Brett Ligon does not. I'm stating no, that stated. generally those books when they come to the attention of Brett Ligon and that is where we are we we I'm not looking for him to define it for us I'm looking at our district to define what we find as acceptable standards as we all know I mean we know we are the the all authority over what we set here forth is comes from us uh, Miss Miss Miss, Miss Odenwell I'd like for you to help me understand what the Values specifically of the district you're referring to, yeah, because that, that's vague. That's ambiguous. That's, yeah. that's totally vague, and, and, and I'm trying to pinpoint some of the buzzwords that are being used. Specific, specifically, I keep hearing porn, right? I keep hearing community values. I keep hearing transparency. Um, I keep hearing uh, well CRT, but I think 90% of people who say CRT don't have an idea what it means. They're just throwing it out there because that's trigger words and buzzwords. So for for me specifically right now. So we can fully understand because you guys seemingly are the only ones that use this word values. Tell me what the values are because your values and my values are starkly different. Tell me what values. Well, first of all, we're not the only ones using the okay, term well, values. That's, values. That's that's stated Explain again in Texas Education Agency Explain Code what the and in our district. Values are because I live in this community along with everyone that I call my circle of folks, and I can guarantee you their values are different from yours. So tell me what your values are. The overall values of our community. Specifically. Well, they do not support anything that violates obscenity clause in 43.21 and the distribution of it in 43.24. I, I didn't actually quote law, right. which I don't think you're you're, you're at all uh, you know capable of doing. So, so help me understand specifically in lay terms because <laughs> I'm very layman. Explain me what but you also didn't like when I tried to discuss educational Explain things with you because I didn't have the standards for it, but I'm an educator by trade and degree. Oh, good, good for you. But here's what I want to say. I think I You're so out condescending. I, I, Mr. President, that just who I, am. I think you need to take control. So yeah. I want to explain I, community, community that value. If I may, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I think what is being, what, what's happening is there's a, it's, it's a conversation. We're trying to be respectful. I'd like for us to be respectful. But if you get challenged, it's a challenge. You, you, you so asked for that. A you challenge. Asked have a and I gave you an answer. No, you and it not. wasn't it standard was enough for you. Here's what I think your your values are. Non LGBTQ. I, I would ask you to refrain from explaining her Hurt values. my values. She has it. If she hasn't given I you I asked for the values. If I you're understand. not gonna give me the values, That's I have to point. interpret what she's saying. If you're not gonna be specific, someone has to do the, some interpretation just like anything else. I'm trying to adhere to community values. So given the fact what your community values are. Did you read through any of this that I stated? that I sent to you? No, I have my share of junk food. I don't need any further. Okay, again, once again, very condescending. Have I once come at him personally about his his standards, his education, his work, or anything? No. 
You still have not one. What your values are. I can tell you my values. That's not necessarily everybody else's values. That's my and that's point. not what that's I'm judging point. this on. What I am judging my decisions and my policy that I put forth that aligns with many districts across the many districts across this state, as well as with Mike Morath's last update to the Texas Education um, Agency's printout and policies and guidelines for us to look at as a minimum standard, as a minimum guideline, and for us to then take and adopt what works for us in our way in our district. We're trying to get rid of ambiguity. Define Mike Morath doesn't values. sit on this board. Oh, the, you're absolutely values. correct. We do. we do. The seven of us were elected yes. and sent here to do this. So define community value as you interpret. You, I just gave you my reason. My, my, you give me so, yours. If, if I may, if I may, I think the reason I, why. I think give, me, give me a second, Mr. Williams. Williams. Give me a second, Mr. Williams. What, what I'm hearing so far, right, from from every from both sides, and I'm not talking about. I'm talking about on sides of me. <laughs> yes. Both, side, both sides of me, is nothing specific. There's nothing specific. I understand where you're going, Ms. Oldenwelder, but you're not saying anything specific, Ms. Duncan. I understand you're saying. It's, it's, it doesn't align. I'm not hearing any specific. Well, it doesn't align with this. So, so in order to really get specific right. in what in you're asking me, I, we're I trying like to get to some specific with, things out. With each of you so that you could review this and compare this against the policy that the district revised versus the policy that was given to the board. Okay, but could you first. please give me something specific? Like we're, we're, yes, we're talking about making, making some big decisions here. And all I'm hearing is it doesn't line up. It doesn't line up. It's just it's the same. It was in April, in August. If you could give me something specific, and, I, and, I, and I would also ask you this, if you don't mind, um, when you say what we want, I'm not sure what that means. I mean, I, we. No, 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 don't speak well, for we me. We all represent. No, our no, no. Community. What I mean is when you say when we when we read this or we. I would ask you to refrain from speaking for me. If you want to speak for yourself, that's perfectly fine. I never intended fine. to speak for you. I understand. That's why, and I don't mean to imply. I'm just saying, don't. I'm, I'm asking you. That's that's how it's kind of coming out. Mm -hmm. So, or if there's another we that, the, that that you're talking about, just explain who that we is. Go ahead. You're talking to me. Yes, ma'am. I can't see you. I, I know. Sorry. Um, all I'm asking, me personally. Yes. I. I'm asking that this board of seven members mm -hmm. review this release of an example policy that was sent out last April that I'm not even sure yet if you've seen. And I'm not saying you have it. You can't confirm that you have. I'm asking that we look at this, compare it to what the district created, and compare it to the example that Ms. Odenweller provided, and let's see where we can find common ground. That way, we remove any any ambiguity, any gray areas of our Conroe ISD okay. EFB policy. So is it is it okay for me to assume that you have done that? Yes. Would yes. you please give me some examples of the difference? I just gave an example oh. when I was first speaking. I'll go forward. I'll go forward. Oh, go ahead. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, go Hold ahead. On. This policy does not even mention our authority as a seven-member board to create this policy. We don't create procedure, but we create a policy that determines procedures. And we're not in we're not mentioned in this policy. But you do understand that it's implied. I don't want implication. I want wording. I don't want to sit here and have hours long conversations about books. But man, we're we the other last month we did not have an hour long conversation about the book policy. That was during a, a, a hearing, a level three hearing, mm -hmm. where we were trying to determine what it was, what action we were going okay, to take. Okay, let me better phrase that. I want to av avoid a level three hearing. I want to avoid reconsideration committees. I want our selections to be done by the librarians, and I want them to have confidence in this policy. I want us to have confidence in this policy, and right now I don't see that being the case. So is the current policy that we have right now is not allowing librarians to do their and job? For me, personally, no. Okay. May I comment now? Yes, Sorry, I didn't mean to yes, step on that earlier. You asked for specific. Yes. So the district brought forward administratively um, a proposal of changes to our previous or to our current 
board policy. On page three, they added the word Texas before education code. That's a minor change. Page four, adding the word with after complainant, minor change. Page four, adding the following, including community members who are not the parents of currently enrolled students to the third full paragraph. I agree with that. Who determines the community who the community members will be? Page four, proposing alternative policy, addressing my request to be on the committee, which we're going to table for the meanwhile because we said we would talk about book policy before. Um, proposing alternative policy, which has to do with that. Uh, adding page four also, adding district shall solicit volunteers to serve in accordance with the district's procedures. That's woefully inadequate. That's very, that shall, the word shall solicit, does not cite what procedures are being referred to as done throughout the policy or what those procedures are. Does not state that those who, solicit will, who are solicited will actually serve on a committee. It does, it, who and how is that to be determined who to solicit? Who determines of those who have been solicited are responding saying they would serve, they will serve actually on being on the solicited committee. Does not state how many people, minimum or maximum, will serve on the committee other than it will be an odd number. Page four, added, will post the findings on the district library services page. That's a good thing, but it's, deficit, it, it's deficient because it does not state how soon after the committee makes its determi determination when it will be posted. Will it be before the time file? Will it be before the time file and appeal from the committee's findings? Page four, added the board of trustees shall receive a copy of the report. That's a good thing, but is it being sent to the president of the board or to all members? Should it be sent to each of the board members? Shouldn't it be sent to each of the board members? Library materials, so the, again, moving forward, there are some other things that are also vague, but those are just, that's what came in this, from the district. Mm -hmm. That was supposedly to clear up vague and unclear. Now granted, that isn't, we're not addressing one of the issues that was covered in here that I didn't go to, which was on the book reconsideration committee. Mm -hmm. But if that's an example of how we clean up unclear, vague, ambiguous, then I'm actually offended and appalled that at least the, the time wasn't given to just skim through or read this. Because it, it, this, this is like the minimum we should expect. I think they're being overly generous. Have you seen this? Pattern? Who's being overly generous? The district. And even, even suggesting some of these edits. I think it is ridiculous that we continue to spend our time and countless energy talking about this topic like we are we are tasked with improving student outcomes ensuring that students and staff have safe and secure spaces and making sure taxpayer dollars are spent in a fiscally responsible way tell me how this helps any of those priorities. In fact, I would say not only is it not creating value for those things, it is being wasteful of district resources and going through all of these, all of these things to be, I think, very overly accommodating to y'all. And to, I, to us personally we, or we to the people to that sent us yeah, here? Define y'all. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it, just when you say to y'all, I need you to be specific. Like when you, it, uh, I don't want you to be accusatory. Specifically, to specifically, the three board members who are asking and complaining about the current policy. Uh, specifically, the three board members that exhaust countless administration, administration and teachers hours with requests that have no value whatsoever. And when we complain about how much we burden our staff and how much our staff is tasked with continuously being tasked with year in and year out and we continue to add to that with these type of frivolous requests that we're constantly getting from the three board members specifically Ms. Oldenwellow, Ms. Tiffany and Ms. Duncan. Duncan. So I'm going to be specific. 
So we we got it. We have a motion on the floor. Yeah, I was going to say we have a motion. Is there, is there any more dis no, discussion? I'd like to uh, clearly understand that motion. Okay. okay no, no problem. I'll read it. I'll enjoy it. I propose that we reject the district's proposal, proposed policy change, as well as any policy change that limits access to our school libraries. Again, the proposal is that this board take no action on our current policy. So you're saying you're moving for no action? That's his motion. Let me get this clear clarity thing going. I propose That's exactly. we take no action on the current policy. Neil. Right. Any other discussion? So I would about ask in, in response to, to Mr. Williams' motion and, and to Ms. To Ms. Um, Chase Chase's Chase. comment. I heard you talk about it's our responsibility to ensure student outcomes, safe spaces, quality teachers, support, all of that. We, you do understand we do that through policy. We might not sit here and, and physically write the policy, but as a board, it's our responsibility to review our district's policies, whatever those policies may be, and, and make sure that those policies not only protect and offer security for the 10,000 employees that are here, and but the children as well. So I take that responsibility very seriously, so much so that after seeing this revision to this one policy, mm -hmm. I, I have a big issue even approving uh, adjustments to other policies that now we're going to, I mean, I'm losing confidence in what, so you've been here 10 years. What policy have you been involved in developing? All of them. Really? Over the last 10 years. So I agree with you 100%. We're responsible for the policy and reviewing the policy. Mm -hmm. The fact that I don't want to take any action says that I have full faith in the current system as it has worked over the years, many, many I years. I would disagree. Prior to it. Well, you know, That's if okay. you have one roach in your house, you don't condemn the house. You don't lock everybody in. You know, you get rid of the one roach. Comparison. So that's, that's, it is what it is. I mean, you guys are essentially saying we eradicate, <laughs> pretty much go on this witch hunt, if you will, of books. Well, well you're I'm saying that I'm there's saying never this policy has worked. It's based on students flocking here, based on the success rates we've had, based on the quality of students you just heard uh, come to the podium, and how articulate and well-read and how well-versed and how many accolades they gave. We're talking about parents. Our expectation is for these kids to succeed, all right? Not for parents to go on these political and these cr crusades and all this other stuff that interferes with the success of our students. That's what we're here for. I propose that the policy that's in place is sufficient to do that, to accomplish that, and it has been sufficient over the years, and I think it will continue to do that. I think the district's job, to a certain degree, is to appease some of the folks on this board. I'm not in that out of business. I think what's in place now does exactly what we intended to do. And so my, my motion is what it is. I expect us to vote on the motion. Mm -hmm. Ms. Mm -hmm. Ms. Um, uh, Ms. Galanis, the current policy that we have also includes the form to opt out for any kind of that's a procedure. That, right, that procedure, is not yes. a policy. Mm -hmm. Right. But we still have that. It's been our practice for years. Mm -hmm. we, we create, I drafted a form. But it's know, book by use. book. Yes. Again. yes. And how, is, how are our work. parents supposed to know every one of the books that we have in our library and its content and its quality? Our experience over the last 20 or so years has been that parents that have a concern about a book are well aware of the title and make the library known so that their child can not have access. And that's to that why we have so many parents speaking up now because they're becoming more aware of what is not what to the standards of what they thought they were in our library. And that's why there's so much concern and there's so much discussion about it and that is why we brought it to the boards dis to discuss. I'll just say this. I think Ms. Jamison hit the nail on the head, Ms. Christy Jamison. When I sent my kids to CISD, right, I opted in. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I have a book, if you guys come up with a book, and by the way, if you guys want that charge, go through our libraries, and you you, you be the gatekeeper for the parents here that want to opt in and opt out. Let you, go, you do that. But I, I'm saying that we've charged professionals. A parent did we not. We charge professionals as elected officials. We charge Dr. Noll to do his job and to hire librarian professionals to do exactly what we're so say fearful of, right? If we've charged them to do that, let's continue to trust that they've given us no reason to deny or to doubt that they've been doing their job sufficiently over the many, many years that I've sat in this seat and the many, many years prior to me. Now all of a sudden this crusade is going on 
and we finally got another rally cry of, 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 of a little small group of folks that's causing us all this headache. I Let's think continue to move forward. I, 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 we've heard everything everybody has to say. We understand your point. We're not going to get to common ground here. Okay, so I've let you speak. I'd like to have uh, a moment to speak. I completely disagree with your strong... I strongly disagree that when a parent registers a student in our district, they do not abdicate their parental consent, and, and they do not abdicate what they believe to be acceptable for their child just because they enrolled them in a school district. There are things... In, in districts, just as she, as another parent or Ms. Jamison stated, that parents can opt out on. But when it comes to things that are developmentally appropriate and content that is above level that can co- potentially cause harm, parents should be fully informed of what that is. So, so, so about to, to your point, we're saying that the school district, when we trusted our kids every day, we put on that bus and we send these to. We don't believe that they have our best interests of our kids at heart, and we don't believe that they're going to take inappropriate, blatantly inappropriate material out of the library. They're going to subject our kids to all this pornography and subject our kids to CRT and subject our kids to, let me see another one of them, uh, maps that are poisoning and killing the kids. Um, subject our kids to, what, what were some of the other ones that were thrown out there? Um, when parents are saying that this is happening, how do we not believe that this is happening? I, 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 I have three kids. I have six. Well, good, well, there you go. So we, we, you have some, I have some. Yeah. I'm saying, right, that the policies work this year. So you need to tell the folks at McCullough, right, that, uh, or at Woodlands High School, where your kids are, that they need to stop exposing your kids to porn. And tell those teachers when you go see them on campus <laughs> tomorrow and say, look, you guys are exposing my kids to porn, and I expect you to stop it. Are you stating so there are no books of concern in our libraries? I'm saying that there's roaches in my house. I'm saying my expectation is to eradicate them as I see them. That's what I'm saying. So how are I'm, we to I'm eradicate them I'm without a standard? I'll I'm tell sorry. you, if I may, if I may. I, I don't want it to get too far out of hand, but um, I'll tell you the, the research that I did on this as well. So um, you went to Mike Morath, it's fine. I went to our district. I went to our librarians. I met with probably half the librarians in the district. And I wanted to know, I also uh, spoke with uh, Miss Millie Heiser, whom I greatly respect. And she is, she's a wonderful person doing her best. What I found out was this. In all these meetings, it was a resounding same thing. Mr. Hubert, we have no desire, no desire to indoctrinate any children. We want children to read. We want people to read. We want all of our students to be able to to identify with a book that helps them get through whatever issue it is. Also, some of these books, as we had some young men, uh, some students talk about today, are AP ready. They're getting them ready for, for advanced placement. And if we don't challenge these kids for advanced placement, then the, the, the college board is watching us as well. And they may, uh, they may say, you know what, we're not going to offer as many AP classes because you guys are not providing the opportunity for the students to broaden themselves. I did read through all of the stuff. I read through the stuff that you provided us from Keller. I also read through the Office of Civil Rights, which they have a discrimination case against them right now for the policy that they're putting in place, Mm -hmm. and that's of concern to me as well. Also, the Keller idea that you had, uh, it has this rating for all the books, a million books that we have. You talk about parental involvement, completely takes parental involvement out because you have an outside selection committee of which is we have no control over and we don't even know who they are. And I know y'all are pounding us about transparency. You gotta have be transparent. We gotta know every every person on this reconsideration committee, but don't even tell us who's on this who's who's picking these books for us. So I will say this, I trust our librarians. I trust the system that we have. I trust their hearts are for the students and for the kids. And they are the ones that we need to leave it up to them. They have to do two hundred hours every two years of cons- of of um, um, continuing education, and they have master's degrees. How many hours of continuing education as a board member do we have to do on an annual basis? Three, four? Two hundred. They have to do two hundred. And quite honestly, on the opt-out, on the opt-out, when I did some research on that since, uh, since this all came up, very few, if any, parents are calling. So I'm not denying that the circles that you're in 
that people are concerned about that. I completely respect and understand that. But from the research that I was able to do, I don't see it. And as far as an opt-in, I saw what they're doing at SciFair. And these books are labeled, and they're, they're labeled on there um, sexually explicit. No way in the world would I want my, our students to have access to books that say sexually explicit. Digitally, I'm fine with. And I, I wish that we could amend the, the, um, uh, the, the motion to consider the items that our librarians and our administrators have, um, have, have suggested because they're, they want to work, they want to make sure things are done. But I don't know if we're going to get there. So that's, I got those are the things that I saw. That's what I see. So you were able to do research and get answers. You were able to ask and get answers. Do you know that I've asked and been waiting for answers on some things? I asked. Who'd you ask? I, well, I asked our library specialist. Why didn't it get back to you? I don't know why she didn't. But I will tell you. You're saying she she refused to get back to I'm you? not saying she refused. I'm just saying she what hasn't gotten back with me. Well, I asked for the um, access she, that we were provided with content on using two, in our policy, using two professional resources or whatever. Mm -hmm. I wasn't able to even access them because they require a subscription. And you have to pay for them to get to certain things to see them. So when I was wanting to evaluate, did I agree with that? Did, could I no. live with that? I, could, I asked for, for access to them and logins, and I've not been answered. And I said I needed it in preparation for tonight's meeting, and I wasn't given it. So that's just one example. Okay. Uh, I'm just stating that I did try to check into the information that we were provided, and I, wasn't given, I didn't get the access. But I, I didn't go to the same sources you went to. What I'm saying is, I went to our district. I went to our, I went to the district. I went to our librarians. How did you go to them? I went right to. The, I, I did this. Hey, Principal So and So, this is Skeeter Hubert. I'd like to come talk to your librarian. Would that be okay? And I, as a matter of fact, I talked to Dr. Knoll as well. Not that I need to, but out of respect to let him know and let the principals know that I was coming onto your campus because I wanted them to know what it was about. And I'm telling you, wide in their eyes when I walked in and very open and honest with me. I also, uh, through the help of somebody in the community, asked if I could put together a little conversation, a back and forth um, with, with some librarians. And we were going to have four or five show up, but we ended up having about 15 to 20 show up. And I sat there and I listened to them. Tell me what's going on in your libraries. Tell me if this is a, a, is a real issue. And all of them were like, look, we, we don't we don't want porn in the libraries. We're not trying to push an initiative. We don't, if a parent, uh, one, one uh, I have to say this, one librarian shared with me that, and this was at an elementary school, so I went to all of them, elementary school where there was a, a, a student where their pet had just passed away. And there was a book that discussed this for the, for the kid. And the, the parents came back and said, we want to handle this on our own. We don't want that influence. And that librarian said, no problem, I'll make sure. My point is, the librarian didn't say, oh, but let me tell you why you need to read this. They didn't do that. They listened to the parent. And they said, no problem, we'll mark it, we'll make sure that your student doesn't have it. They do this all the time, all the time. They do not need us to interfere with their job. I understand that we write a policy, but we do not have we don't rule with a with an iron fist and say this is what you must do and get into logins and doing oh, that's not our role we have one person that we supervise and he sits right over there we do not supervise the schools we 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 write the policies we ask miss galatis to gather our points together and that is what they did so I'm sorry that you were surprised. I'm not sure where you got your board training from but I'm 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 surprised that you are surprised that, that you got anything in return because that's what they do. They listen to us, they gather information, and they put stuff together. It is not our role to go out and write the policy. It is our role to give the ideas of what we want to do, and that's what we did in August, and that's what they came back with. So this I, is not an issue. So it's not an issue. I disagree. It is what we were tasked to do. Mr. President. We were tasked we to write policy. We are tasked to write policies. And the district is to to carry them out. Yes. Agreed. And, and Agreed. And I don't do. mean that we. I don't mean when that we're legally 
sitting there writing out the documents right. of what the legal ease is. Mm -hmm. But it is to be written and developed by us. No, no. I've not written a policy, nor any board member before me has ever written a policy. Then maybe you shouldn't be serving. Maybe no, so, that's but I'm not. Here. No. And guess what? Guess what? <laughs> I'm going to be here for the next two years. So until then, I, I would like to add here. Why not let the parents decide? Why, why, why give the parents the ultimate decision? Okay, I will. I will. That's, what, that's, that's what we're doing. But I'm not going to read every book that my child brings home. If Mr. President, can you call the vote? Did, um, can you call the vote? I read every book my child brought home. Uh, well, how many kids do you have? Two. Okay, well, I have can six. You call well, I'm not going to read all of them. But that is my commitment to my children. I think that's our responsibility as parents. Let's go ahead and call the vote. So would you please restate the vote? Just make sure we don't. May I ask one question real quickly? Please, yes, Mr. Hubert, you stated that you wish that this pol that this um, vote could be amended to do something, and it can't. So, I'm not if there was amendments, it can. Mr. President, okay. I propose that we reject the district proposed policy. She's been talking since we started the proposal. I bet if we did a word yeah. count, yeah. you yeah. far yeah. succeeded me. All right, all right, all right. Let's do and this. Any policy. Let's do this. Let's call call your. I'm going to call the vote. I'm asking you just to to. Um, to say it one more time, I, I just gave my expression that I, I liked the suggestions because I liked the fact that the the school district and those librarians and everybody was willing to to work with us. Gotcha. They're listening to us. So Mr. that President, was my proposal. I propose my... that we reject the district's proposed policy and any policy that limits access to our school libraries. We take no action on any current on right. any policy. That is that our motion, Thank and you. we have a second. All right. All those in favor of the motion, show by the uplifted hand. Any opposed by the same sign? All right, motion one two. Oh, sorry. One two. Oh, sorry. It, it fails. So, do we have another motion? I would like just a point of discussion. Can you hear me, Peter? Yeah. Can you I, if me? we have a motion, okay. yes, ma'am. Okay. I make a motion that we spend some time to improve the policy by reviewing it against the. TEA's April 2022 suggested policy, recommended guide, guideline for a policy so that the entire board can see the deficiencies and make a decision at a later date. So that's your motion? Do we have a second? No second, motion fails. Can't we just table? We can just table this discussion. We can, we but we'll just keep coming up. Thing. It'll just keep coming up every, every month. No, Mr. President, do you have a motion? Well, I'd love to make a motion, but I'm not sure that I can make the motion. Uh, my, su my suggestion was to uh, to adopt what was given to us in the in the email, which was to allow the uh, um, the, the the nine or ten points that they that they. I'll provided accept that. I'm not accepting the. I'll second that without the opt-in, opt-out policy. Okay. I'll accept the motion as presented what without nine the opt-in, opt-out Which nine yeah. points? Without the opt-in, opt-out sheet that I'm we're asking Mr. Hubert. I'm not yeah. talking to you. So I'm, hold on, hold on. Let me, give me a second to I find what I was you. referencing. Uh, got my papers kind of scattered. I know. I would, but I have my notes, so I'll make sure I do it the right way. So there was an attachment that we were provided. This one? Yes, ma'am. So that draft, the draft attachment that we were, that we were provided. And basically, of the power school form, is that what you're referring to, Mr. Hubert? Yes. Would you? Yeah, so that would be a form that, that we could include in our, what we call first day forms. Um, they exist in power schools. So if you have kids in the district, you do it every year. You get the email, you go through. You accept the handbook, you accept um, privacy tabs, the variety of things that you fill out as a parent on the first day. They are, um, they are required forms. So really, truthfully, the, the conversation about opting in and opting out is it's kind of it's moot. It's actually parent choice, period, because they would say yes or they would say no, and you have to say one or the other. Everyone fills the form out, so you would say, yes, my child can can access these titles with mature content, or no, my child can't. So it's opt-in or opt-out. Parental consent. Yeah, opt-in or opt-out refers that there is a, 
that there is a standard one way or another and that, that there's a default. This, what we've proposed or brought forward to you, there is no default. Everyone must affirmatively answer the question yes or no. So there is another hurdle that we're putting in place with, yeah. this, with the addition of this form. It's at the beginning. It is. School. It's one time. It's, it's, it's at the beginning of the year, yes, sir. At one time, parents would say yes or no, my child can access um, mature themes. But it we is would, that. But it, it's not a, I wouldn't. I would characterize it as parent choice. I would not characterize it as opt in, opt out, because, like I said, that implies a default. Right. There's not one in, in this. What we're, what uh, we're I, I, to. I will accept the board's policy with the exception of this form. Okay. No. So we need. A, I don't believe I can make. I motion that we accept board's policy, except with the exception of. Of adding this form at the beginning of the year. We haven't had discussion over everything that you were referring right. to in that. Just want I'll to make sure. I'll get a second sure. and then we'll okay. talk about okay. it. Okay. Sure. I have a motion. So that's the motion. Do we have a second? Second. Do you have a motion and a second? All right, Ms. Oldenweller. Did you? Well, I'm just stating that he's made a, a another broad motion there that says we're going to accept the policy, but it that would mean that we're also in embracing the things that were put forth that we haven't even discussed yet, such as, such board, as. the book reconsideration and so forth. So I'd, I'd still like to keep that tabled at the moment. and To bring up after this is done. During and let's time. talk just yes, about the parental consent. That's fine. Yep. So parental consent is, I don't think, back to what you were stating about Ms. Jamison and the opt-in, opt-out. Our whole thing is we don't abdicate our parental role and we should give our parents an option. You ask them to agree to a handbook, we should also agree to what content level our students are being received. What I'm not sure about from what Dr. Knoll stated or when he was talking mature, mature theme is what is defined. We haven't defined what mature theme is as of yet. Exactly. So do we want to address that in a later meeting or in a letter discussion or we, I mean, what? We're, Where's that definition and def of how it will be defined? Who will define it? What it includes? Ms. Oldenwell, I apologize for cutting you off. So That's okay. Go ahead. In the past, so I'll do a better job of that. But I put the motion out. Um, so are you asking me a question? No, we were open to discussion right now. So I was just making discussion point that there's vagueness in it and that we don't know those answers. Yep, I so think, Ms. Odenweiler, you um, make it obvious that it would not end, the discussion would not end, so I don't think it is the right move to add an additional uh, form that a parent needs to check off because the discussion would not stop there. So yeah. what is the point? Anytime well, you submit a form to a parent that says mature this, mature that, it implies that you're exposing your kids to something that we're not necessarily exposing our kids to. I think every librarian has the expectation to, uh, to expose kids to age-appropriate material, right? If I'm my kids in a, and they're all reading the Bible, by the way, I'll just throw it out there. Age-appropriate material, that's the expectation, right? Mr. President, you got a you got a, you got a motion on the floor. I got a motion on the floor. I don't need the theatrics. Right. Yeah, this is. What, I'm just stating my point that I'm going to is. I'll let you make your point. My point that I'm going to is we have a problem. We, we can't just bury our heads in the sand. I'm not asking to make decisions for what a parent chooses to put in their child's hand. I'm asking the parent to make that decision. I, I've okay. Heard you loud and clear. Very good. But I don't know what those books are that you're just pulling out. I, I, I appreciate what you're doing there. But back to Ms. Wagaman's point, are, are these books that you're showing, are these the ones that have been challenged and have a ruling against them? Or is this open to subject? Because I'm telling you is you got, I, I'm, I'm willing to accept the, the motion and, and talk about this and taking out, taking out the, uh, the, the opt-in opt-out or the, the parental approved. Um, parental consent because I want us to move forward on something and I'm, I'm willing to Can we move I'm, I'm willing to do that this, so this is getting ridiculous. 
let's just do this. Let's go ahead and I will call the vote. Um, Wait, can, Wait, can what you repeat? Can you the motion is that we accept the board policy as presented with the exception of this, the form that goes out at the beginning of the school that with okay. Yeah, with but this, I also uh, stated there are other things in that policy that we have not addressed, which was the book reconsideration committee. Well, we're not. We're going to talk about that. In a, in a okay, second. but his motion does not state that. He says accept it with the exception of the mature content. Mature content thing, or the parental. Um, the access to library materials consent form. Mm -hmm. That's correct. I think there's also one other issue because there's an or in here, so there's two conflicting statements yeah. in With this the draft. And so oh, right. whatever the motion is, it needs to pick one of those. Mm -hmm. And the policy, do, the policy does not address an opt-in or opt-out form. That would be addressed in procedure. Okay. It still is. It currently is. Yeah. Correct. It's, it's, yeah, the procedure is administrative. That we can change that. So in the in the policy that you're being asked. You know, looking at the one that the draft that the, that we sent, uh -huh. administration sent doesn't address opt in, opt out, or a registration form at all. Ms. Galatis, you're referring to the or for the reconsideration, the board member on the re yes, yeah, yes. okay. So can you can I amend your yes, motion? Yes, you can, and I'll accept yeah? your amendment. Okay, to include uh, and make explicit uh, that board members are not allowed on the reconsideration committee. I, I don't have I exact your wording. I accept, your, I accept your friendly amendment. Okay, so what we need to do is we you accept that. So you it's adding, adding it. Proce it's procedurally, adding. procedurally, what we need to do is you're making so amendment I, I, I to the motion. So we need to we need to vote on accepting. We need a second to the amendment. A second. I think that he. Okay, so we have a second. So now we have a second. Now we're going to talk about the amendment to the motion, which is. To add uh, and make it explicit that a board member is not allowed to serve on the reconsideration committee. Okay, so let's open Thank up you. conversation. We need to open up conversation specifically for that item. Is there any discussion only. about that item only. only? I'll go back to my original point that if we if we improve the policy to begin with, we wouldn't need a reconsideration committee because there would be such clarity in this policy. We're just talking about the motion to... Yeah, right. so I'm asking you about your... Any discussion I'm sorry, about... Thank you. I'm problem. sorry, go ahead. It's exactly right. The whole board over there. Um, he's unwilling to improve the policy. He wants us to either adopt it as is, with this exception now, this amendment, to accept that a, a board member can't serve on a reconsideration committee. That wouldn't be the issue if if we as a board would agree to go back and and review this and compare it to uh, okay. I hear you. a suggested policy and make some revisions, improvements. As a board, we can make a, we, we should make improvements to policies that are brought before us. I'm just asking about being on the reconsider a board member being on the reconsideration committee. Adding that, is there any other discussion about that? Solomon well, Waller. Well. The and whole point, as I had a discussion with you, I'm sorry, what were you saying, Ms. Okay. Go ahead. The whole point was, in our discussion, when you and I talked, and when I talked with Dr. Nall, is I said, with improvements to the book policy, mm -hmm. the need for a board member to be on the book reconsideration committee wouldn't be there. But we have done nothing to revise it. So we're right back where we were last month. Okay, so but we're going to put something in motion today. So do you have any do you have anything to add about the amendment? The, the amendment? I think she did. She added what she needed to add. Mm -hmm. we're I, good? I thought she just added that we would not uh, that what correct. we were about to vote on would not allow a book uh, a we're board only a, member. So we're, on the we're, we're voting on that correct. that amendment that no yeah. board member will be allowed on the reconsideration committee. That's the And we're also accepting this revision of the policy. No, we're doing just this, the this amendment. amendment. We're, we're just, just doing the amendment. amendment. So there was a motion. We didn't solve the problem. That depends on which because then you have to go back to the original motion. I'll have to motion. go back to the original. So first the amendment and then we'll go back right. to the original okay. motion right. and everyone can decide if they're going to accept the whole package. Right. <laughs> can we uh, awesome. make a vote on the amendment please, Mr. President? Yeah. We can, so there's no other discussion so, about it. I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding that sure. what is being put forward that we are trying to vote on right now is we are strictly saying a board member cannot be 
a part of the book reconsideration committee. That's, that's what we're about to take a vote on. We're, yes. we're voting on that to be a, to be added to the, the motion. That's correct. Yes. To the current policy. No, to be no, added to, to, the, to, the, to the original the motion. motion. Okay. We got it. I think so. Miss Duncan, you I got it. You good down there? Yeah. Okay. All those in favor of the amendment, show by the uplifted hand. Any opposed by the same sign? All right. Four to three motion. Uh, the amendment carries. Now we have the motion is new. So the motion is except policy as the current policy, uh, with the exception of the op the form the form sent out, and with the amendment that says that no board member can serve on the uh, reconsideration reconsideration committee. library reconsideration okay. committee. Any more discussion about this? Yes, and so we're still going to keep the form no. that we no. already have in place. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just not add in paperwork at the beginning of the right. year. That's the yes. motion. That's what we're but we're allowing the the you know just the, the, the additions but, that. But it would staff. just for clarification's sake here. With the motion that you made, based on what we sent, would be the the determination of a mature um, category being mature being themed. mature mature category being created right yes. mm -hmm. so in that sense it does change the nature a bit of the other form because mm -hmm. the current opt out form is by type we could change right? that procedure no, right understood but i'm just trying to make sure everybody's on the same page here mm -hmm. that the current opt out form is by title so with your motion the opt out form could could include the mature category, so it could. I, I prefer the opt out form to say a book specifically mm -hmm. or the category mm -hmm. specifically. Mm -hmm. Understood, that, but that's what that's I my point is that. the op, the current opt out is by title or author only. The Fair it, under this category, if we have a category, we would have an opportunity for the opt out to include that category, so it becomes more broad for parents to to be involved. And yes, yeah. there'll be. The, the next piece is the discussion of what's mature, what's not. That's a whole. Another level of discussion, right? That we have to work I, through. I don't like the concept, I, but yeah. I, I move on. Yeah, but it's just digitally. There's, these books are not labeled; they're labeled digitally inside the catalog. Yeah, just the, it would, could be. Just digitally. Yeah, so when you you go to check out mm -hmm. a book, yes. if you if your parent has said you cannot check out a book that has a mature, it would correct. show up like you're not allowed to check this book out. Right. That's I, it. I personally am not in favor of of having this mature category. Mm -hmm. I think it's just kicking the can down the road and we just have another endless discussion about what we did define as mature. I think at the end of the day, we have professional librarians in our libraries that we task with responsibility to make sure age appropriate books are in in the libraries. And at some, some point we have to trust them. Ms. Chase, I'll accept another friendly motion. Right. Well, hold on. but. Oh. Uh, I, I agree with what you're saying, but I also trust the, the librarians to be able to determine what those things are, right? They they, they know what a ninth grader can, can exactly. read. Exactly. Right. Why do they need another category? I don't know. What is the point here? I, it's just a digital. It's just it's just digitally in the catalog but itself, right? That's that's mm -hmm. all. I think the better question would be why not? Why not? Because, because we will never stop this discussion. We will never stop this discussion, and it is, it is, it is not respectful of what we're tasked here to do. It is not improving student outcomes. It is not ensuring safe and secure spaces for our students and our staff, and it is definitely not an appropriate and fiscally responsible use of taxpayer money. Please define a safe and secure space. My, uh, my original motion is sounding pretty good right about now. <laughs> so, Mr. Hubert. Keep talking. Um, last month, you were in favor of an opt-in on a book. Yes. Why would we not still stick with parental consent of an opt-in on mature themes? Yeah. In library content. I'm glad you asked that question because like I said I went back and I, I studied what opt-in really meant and what it looked like and the, the intensity of the work that the librarians would have to do and is it really an issue in, on our district? 
it just didn't make sense. I don't know. Did you see the pictures of Cypher and what they're doing and how they're labeling these books? I saw that and my jaw dropped. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm, that's I have no intention of doing that to to our librarians and having those books labeled like that. And so mm -hmm. as we went through it, I, I realized and I learned that the opt-in option is not it's it's not it would not be as effective and it would be a tremendous amount of work on everything um, that. We just it's just not necessary for our district so it may work for other districts and I would respect the other districts that do it but for ours after what I was learned it, it just wouldn't be effective in my opinion so, so that's, so that's why I changed. Are protecting the librarians and not kids? I like well that. I like the way you spawn What I'm saying is you, you think they're on opposite sides? No, I'm just asking if this is all about extra work for librarians, but what about the kids? That well, once again, I, I think it I think it boils down to I, I, I trust the librarians. Do you let, trust the librarians? I mean, I have a master's degree. In Do Christian you trust the librarians? I don't know the Bible, so I I'm not asking you that. Have, Do you trust the librarians? Do you trust the librarians to do their job? I understand that nobody's perfect. Do you trust the librarians? Okay, so define trust. To what trust them to do. Okay, so fair enough. So. The issue, it doesn't matter degrees. I don't, we don't want to get into any of that stuff. All I'm saying is I trust the librarians to do and implement a, a, a mm -hmm. procedure. That, I'm not a librarian. I don't, I, I'm not a reader. Ask, ask my like family. I'm not a reader. Yeah. So I don't okay, need to, I don't need to input myself on I, this. I'd like to propose an amendment to your, to your motion. your amendment. Go yeah. ahead. Your amendment. To, re <laughs> to remove the, um, the mature categorization from your motion to approve. I accept your motion. Your amendment to the motion. It wasn't there. All right, um, so there's a Dr. motion. Null. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Hold on. Let okay. me make sure I state it out right. Yeah. <laughs> this is fun. You guys are stretching me here on this procedural stuff. Okay. Um, so we have a motion to amend the policy, which is to the strike motion. the district, oh. or just to just strike the category. Strike the categorization yes. of the book and strike. And that has been seconded. That's correct. Okay. Motion and a second for that. Do we have any discussion? Yeah. So, Dr. Knoll, did you, is there a um, is, is there a source that already does mature content, or would librarians have to go and create that? So, our librarians meet with Melody. The group of them meet as professionals every month. What what we would anticipate in this situation is there may be titles of books that could be informally or formally challenge right we could start with the list of books that we've seen challenged in other places that would make mm -hmm. sense right rather than categorizing a million books mm -hmm. we could start with books that have <laughs> we've seen challenges in other places and you know if they had the ability then to put a mature label on it it gives a middle ground mm -hmm. to um, you know to the conversation uh, like to, to be clear mm -hmm. with the, the the staff's recommendation I don't know if anybody felt like it's a perfect solution. Right. What we're trying to find is a solution that that perhaps we could find middle ground on. Mm -hmm. Sounds like maybe we can't do it, and that's that's life. But w that that was our attempt here, right? Is to honor parent choice, to also honor every parent's choice by not removing books from our library, but mm -hmm. but keeping them in the library, and and also at the same time trusting our librarians to do their job and they can evaluate the books and they may decide that some books need to have that mature theme but we may be talking about 30 to 40 books we're not talking about 10,000 books here that's that's the point right it's just to help us move from this conversation that was our attempt and I think we can if we just well so then my concern is okay so we do the first 30 books and then we have the next wave Agreed. of Understood. the next 30 mm -hmm. books mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and then after that then we have the next wave of the next 30 books and and I've heard parents say you know all over social media oh well this one talks about alcohol so that one should be banned or this one talks about you know whatever and so before you know it we go back to Mr. Williams uh, initial comment from last year we no longer have a library because everybody's going to find something wrong with something except for Anne of Green Gables she's the only book that <laughs> nobody has a problem with um, but my but my point is 
that's why I was asking if there is already a written standard from booksellers that state mature so, so part of to this make it easy. We, we do hope that we are going to get some clarification potentially from the legislature this session. Mm -hmm. So back to Ms. Dungan's question or the, you know, why, why are we trying to take an intermediate step now versus mm -hmm. blowing the whole thing up? Because all of this conversation may, change. may be moved in four months. Yes. So well, why, why blow the whole thing up today if it can change again in four months? What we were trying to find was a step to move and what we thought maybe everyone could, could, could get behind because we could honor all the things. Sure. And then, right. and then mm -hmm. if in the future it doesn't work, it can always be amended in the future. It can be revisited in the future to go more in depth. All, all those pieces could happen. So, so I Dr. will state that I would prefer that we as Texans, as people in the state of Texas, respect the fact that we have authority over our local area and that's what's been provided for us in Texas. Waiting on legislation out of Austin that may or may not come is just more governmental entities. I mean, I'd rather us make our decisions here. However, I would hope that we would get some better legislation on standards, but really what they set forth is just, I mean, uh, I've been stating the 43.21 and 43.24, and that's state law. So what's the we, difference we don't, on other Because we don't law? own any books that are in violation of state law. Yeah. That's been clarified by, by the authorities that have the authority to make that decision. We can quote it and quote it and quote it, but the authority that has the authority to make that decision has, has made that known. So I won't argue that they're all appro appropriate or inappropriate. It's a whole other level of yes. discussion. But they are not in violation of the law. So books that talk about eight-year-olds licking the, whipped cream the, off naked men is not in violation the, the the authorities that have the the, the people that have the authority who, who to are talk those? about are you are, are you saying law that enforcement. that's a, I'm not saying that's appropriate oh, okay. I'm not no, saying, no, it, no, should no. I'm not saying it should be in, in, in there but back to the you know have there been any uh, prosecutions any of those things no when we have books that are out of line, they should be addressed. So I should take those but to the local police then or to Brett Ligon when I have books Can that are of concern? I mean, I, that's what you're telling me, that because we haven't had legal action taken, then, then therefore we have no books in our library that violate the, the code, the penal code. Mm -hmm. So instead of discreetly and privately bringing books to attention to be considered and looked at, um, I should just take them to the police. Yeah. Okay. No. I got it. I got it. Yeah. I got it. I got my direction. For me? Yeah. All right. I'm going to. Okay. Mind, so I'll obviously. Do we, we, we need to vote we, on we the amendment. We were unsuccessful. It is clear. Uh -huh. It will not stop with, with one discussion. So I, I applaud the district to get creative and try and come up with, with so. suggestions. And, and I, I understand the librarians are just trying to keep books on shelves, right? And so they propose this um, mature category. But uh, I think it is overly... Um, uh, generous and I do not have to be so accommodating um, and I think it wouldn't stop anything it wouldn't stop the discussion it wouldn't stop the attack on them it wouldn't it wouldn't suddenly create trust uh, in them so why on earth would we do that well if that question is for me I'm, I'm not sure but given this new light knowledge that the legislator is, is attacking this and anything we put in force maybe we, we may need to readdress as well it does seem like a moot point to even be talking about yeah. this stuff. So um, I'd like to call the vote at this point. So can you be clear uh, on what your vote is? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, you can. I think we have to vote on the amendment. The amendment. amendment. Yeah. So that's what I'm yeah. calling. The amendment. amendment is that we remove the maturity and the yeah, yeah, yeah. system for the book. That's the amendment. And I'll read the motion once we finish. All right. The so that amendment. So that that's what we're voting. We're voting on that particular amendment. All those in favor of the amendment show by the uplifted hand. Any opposed by the same sign? Oh, wait, what? Sorry. 
because it one, two, three, four, five. Okay, mo okay, the amendment fails. Going back to the original motion, would you read the motion one more time? So the original motion was that we uh, accept the district's policy as presented, with the exception of the form, mm -hmm. as well as not allowing any board member to serve on the district reconsideration committee. Mm -hmm. So that, just to point out, when you were talking about a slippery slope and the willy-nilly of removing books, by voting on removing or not allowing a board member to serve on that committee, mm -hmm. by putting that forth, you are starting a very slippery slope. At some point, you won't have anyone involved in the safety committee unless it's mandated by the state. You won't have anyone in the finance committee unless we mandate that. You, you're removing all these different, you're potentially setting a precedent. Mm -hmm. I, I seriously I do not that, think that is a good idea uh, to remove or to state something like that because you will be setting a precedence on all for future committees. So could a board member submit a book to challenge and then also sit on that committee to challenge that book? Yeah. And then if, it, and if the challenge fails, they'll be on the board that will eventually decide if the book gets goes through or not? At a level three. At a level three. Could that potentially happen? It could possibly is potentially happen. Is that a conflict happen. of interest at all? I'm not going to talk about that hypothetically. What I would like to just point out is that as a, as a rule, if we, I'm just stating any, saying we don't allow a board member, shall not serve on this committee, you're setting a slippery slope you, you to actually, other future committees. No, you directed a question to me, and to my original argument, I think from two meetings ago, my point was in summation, there was a reason why judges don't serve as jurors. That was my summation. You want to go sit on a jury, don't come sit in the ju judge box, it becomes you. So let's move. Yeah, okay, so there's also a reason why when a case is man. appealed, the man that or woman, the attorney that argues at appeals court for their case does not then, if it goes to Supreme Court, argue that same case. Right. It goes to someone else. I appreciate your argument. Yeah, well. That's fine. It just it's just to me it's just it's it's such a huge conflict of interest for for that to happen and and, and I, I know that there have been books that have been submitted for reconsideration by board members and it just seems silly to me that that those board members want to serve on that committee to ch that's being a book that's being challenged that they submitted it, it just it, it just reeks of way I, I oversight would say to that it would seem equally as silly for a teacher or librarian that selected the book that's being challenged to sit on the reconsideration committee so I think that's an equal well, that, argument. Well, well, that I, right there was never challenged in any of the motions that we put forth. You had every opportunity to put that challenge forth. Trying to work forth. toward a position where we don't necessarily need a reconsideration committee. There. It would be there, but we didn't have to go to them because we had better definition of parameters. Mr. President, can we move? Yeah, we'll, we'll call the vote. Did you? No, never mind. All right, very good. Although, so it just so, to be clear, if the motion fails, then we just go back to the, what we've had. And then, if if the legislator has updates, we can address it at that time. That is that right? Is that right? I, yeah, I we have a motion. If there, if, if yeah, the motion. If you have no. If you make the motion there is fails. No motion tonight that passes. Then we just move on with what we have. In place that, yeah. is, that would remain in place. Okay. But it I still doesn't that. answer the our, the question that took us back to the beginning of this conversation. That we just the one question we need answered is still about a board member on right. the reconsideration committee. Fair enough. So okay. you, you can make this vote. If that is not successful, then okay. we still need to answer that question so separately. So if this, this vote fails, then we can make an additional motion to only address that topic, the yes. or part. Make any motion. Okay. Yeah. What we, we can. I'm let's, just let's, yes. speaking out loud. Yeah. All right. Let's move the vote. All right, so uh, I'm calling the vote. All those in favor? Wait, what is, the, <laughs> what is the motion? All right, one more time, one more time. So the, the motion is to adopt the, um, the uh, adopt what the district put forth minus the parental involvement, but adding that no board member will serve on the reconsideration committee. That's the motion. That's the second. That's what our discussion has been. All those in favor of this motion, show by the uplifted hand. One. All those that are against, show by the uplifted hand. All right, six one. Motion Mr. fails. Mr. President, I'd like to submit a, um, a proposal. 
I propose that um, okay. we <laughs> not allow board members to sit on any book. Uh, what do you guys call Reconsideration. it? Reconsideration. Reconsideration committee. Okay. What if the member didn't do we vote have a on the committee? We have so a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion second. Before yeah. you speak, Ms. Duncan sorry, has something to say. Go ahead, Ms. Duncan. I do. I have a question in regard to that motion. Yes. What if the member sits on the committee as an oversight only, doesn't have a vote? No. Why? What What's the point? There's what no is reason. the point? Intimidation? Like, what is the point? Uh, who's intimidated? Really? You're a board member really? and a committee. You're going to have influence. I haven't met one of our librarians that would be intimidated by being me in their presence. Yeah, you should hear them behind your back. You should, you should, you should hear what they say about you. I've talked with some of the librarians, and they're very polite to I'm me. I'm sure they are. I'm polite. sure they are, Miss Holden Roller. But <laughs> what I would, it, I would, well, I, I, I would like to, as, as a matter of discussion, That's not making a motion or That's anything, I, I would like to not state a, 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 that there be any ruling on that because, again, it's a slippery slope. However, President we could, <laughs> however, we We're could discussion. address many of those concerns or my concerns with us just being notified. With the board being aware a book has come to reconsideration and, and a committee has been formed and therefore, I mean, we're not even notified of that. But why? <laughs> Do you not have anything else to do? Do you not That's trust? That's because it's done at a lower level. Yeah, because it's a she lower doesn't level. trust. We don't, we don't she have doesn't trust. We have, have our I know superintendent you do. who has put people in yeah. charge of putting that so together, and they go through it and they discuss it. And the teacher that may be using that that book will come in and also sit there and explain why they're using it, how it works with the teaks. I mean. There's a whole in, a whole big discussion on it, and then from there, if for some reason whoever submitted that original complaint isn't satisfied, then it comes again. And there, I, I was, there's no issue with us notify. We notify the entire public. It's on our website, right. so it's no big. I mean, if, can you, if, just if send you want to, out? I can, can absolutely send it to you all. Thank if you. we have a com if we have one challenge, I can send it to you. That's not an issue at all. Because it's on the website, right. so right. we can. Any other we can any other discussion? It. All right, hearing on a call the vote, all those in favor? Wait, 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 restate the motion, please. The motion okay. is that um, no board members allowed to sit on any library book reconsideration oh, yeah. committee. And that is the only amendment to the policy. Well, there's no, no amendment, amendment. No. it's just a motion. motion. Everything else is dead. I, I think it's just a clarification. Yep. Yep. I think for the record that... Oh, I thought we were, we we were explicitly it stating it. We are we are yeah. specifically well, why not? If, in the if, policy. Well, to be, to be clear, I, if if we want to amend the policy, it's a two that is a two month process. Oh, okay. So no, you could vote today as to to guide us, I guess, to to do that. But you can't. We can't. Uh, we cannot change the policy today to that because it would need to be a second reading of the policy what do you mean? before well, it could be changed. So you We're had in this that policy, out of the original you policy. had some in that policy relative to that, right? It was in that policy, correct? No. Correct. Policy. So we're carving it out of that policy. Well, it's it's unclear in the policy. So w there's there we have two options here. It could we could just be adding it. You could be voting. We could add it to procedure. But if we want to add it to policy, it's a two month process. We'll add it That's there. yeah, just procedure. All so right, I, 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 procedure I, re I retract. Is fine. We'll we'll add that motion. Yeah. My motion. I retract my motion. Now my new motion is that we add to procedure that no board member be allowed to sit on any library book reconsideration committee. Is that, is that good? That's it. Second. Good? Yes. Right, that's our motion. Second. Second. All right. All those in favor of the motion show by the uplifted hand. One, two, three, four. And all those opposed by the show, same sign. One, and in two. All right. Three. All right. Motion carries four, three. No board members on the reconsideration committee. Very good. All right. Moving on to item six. Do we need a, do we need a break? I think we need a break. Okay. I Just don't. a five-minute break, please. May we get through item six before we do the public hearing, and then we can have a quick recess? Sure. Let's do that. Uh -huh. Item six, administration, receive information regarding the campus mascot oh, and nice. school colors for Veterans Memorial Intermediate School and Christopher J. Hines Elementary School. All right, Dr. Winkler and Dr. Medford. Uh,
Show us a cute mascot, please. <laughs> next month. Next yet. month. Oh. Next month. <laughs> <laughs> they are really cute. Oh. Bring me oh, Armadillo. Really cute. <laughs> I needed a happy. I just want to note that I was the original middle school um, assistant superintendent, and I'm only five three. Yay! <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thank you for the first seven footer for the next one. All right, President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. Over the course of the last several months, Mr. Foster has brought to you progress pictures of Hines Elementary. As the building itself continues to take shape, we're at the point of the process where the personality and the traditions of Heinz Elementary will begin to take shape as well. The kickoff to these traditions will start with school colors and the naming of the school mascot. The school colors for Heinz Elementary, much like Gordon Reed Elementary, will be navy blue and cheerful yellow. Um, this is the exact color. You will see in these renderings that the school colors have been incorporated into the design of the building. These uh, colors can be seen throughout the building in common spaces as well as in the classrooms. The next tradition is to establish uh, for uh, Heinz Elementary is the school mascot. Our future Heinz Elementary students and families were invited to be a part of this process starting in January. Students and families were given the chance to submit a school mascot for consideration through an online nomination process, and they definitely took on the challenge. We had 190 mascot nominations that were submitted, and those have been narrowed down to the top choices, which are the Heinz Hawks, the Heinz Heroes, and the Heinz Huskies. Next week, students and their families will have the opportunity to vote on which of the three is their favorite for the new mascot. A recommendation will be brought back to the board at next month's meeting for a final decision. We want to thank all of our Heinz uh, Elementary students and families that participated in this process, as well as our new principal of Heinz Elementary, Aaron Matei. If there are no other questions, I will hand it to Dr. Medford, who will talk about Veterans Memorial and their mascot. All right. <laughs> All right, so while they don't get a brand new gorgeous building, they do get a new to them building that thanks to your support, um, Mr. Foster and his team will spruce it up over the summer for our students as they get to open um, our American Heroes, right? Like what an honor for our students to get to attend school at a campus named Veterans Memorial. So as I'm sure you could have imagined without me putting on the slide that the school colors are red and blue. blue. Red. Um, same, we didn't have quite the participation as the elementary kids, but we did have about 40 submissions, 40 different um, students and their families submitted, and uh, we kind of narrowed down those selections to the Eagles and the Patriots, which seemed to match beautifully uh, with honoring our, our veterans, and as the same way, they will be allowed to vote, and then we will bring that recommendation to you in March as well. So, any questions for us? No. All right, cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Really cute. Please. Yeah. Can, can, can you guys, Dr. Metz, can you bring what you anticipate the um, like the, logo. the logo to be? Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm very much opposed to people's mascots. Just want to put that out there. Thank you. All right. Just want to name people. Very good. Okay. Moving on, uh, item B, or let's see, 6B, receive information on the rollout of the Smart Tag Bus Monitoring System. All right, Mr. This McCord. Is Mr. McCord. President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Noel, I'm here tonight to give you an update on Smart Tag and the rollout. Currently, <coughs> we are in the process of implementing Smart Tag. It went to uh, bid in January of 22. It was board adopted by the Board of Trustees in August of 22. Throughout the fall of 2022, the team has implemented the hardware, worked with the data, gotten the system ready to roll, and we have rolled it out in uh, January of 2023. I'll give you a timeline in just a second. <clears throat> so our first question would be, what is it? Well, what it is, it's a system that helps authorize ridership on buses. For campuses and for leadership of transportation, what it really does is for the first time in 130 years of CISD allows us to know with near real-time accuracy of where buses are. And the, so we can help know where buses are to be able to answer questions for parents or ourselves, which is really exciting. So this is the implementation timeline. And you can see it's already been implemented in Oak Ridge, Grand Oaks, in the Woodlands, 
And in fact, tomorrow will be implemented within the feeder of College Park. And we're really excited about that, followed quickly by Caney Creek and Conroe and Washington High School. So it's been seamless so far. We've overcome uh, uh, su supply issues, and it's been great. So I salute the team. It's a massive undertaking. It really will be the biggest thing done in transportation since computerized digital routing. So we're excited about it. As far as the actual features, it, students will receive a badge. It will look like this, and they will receive, will receive a lanyard and a badge. It's a piece of plastic. It's an RFID pl piece of plastic. So information about the student is not stored digitally in the badge, only a 14-digit 14, 14 unique ID. Without the tablet, which looks like this, this is a Samsung Android-type device, this is actually what is tracked. And they will be on each, each bus, and so there's hardware on the bus that is what is tracked. And so they teach students will come on the bus, and they are actually are now to place, place and deposit the badge on the reader, and that is what allows the uh, student to be registered on the bus when they get on and get off the bus. It does meet a lot of top-level security uh, acronyms. I will not read them all out to you for safety issues. I, will, I do want you to know the data is encrypted. It's encrypted when it's at rest, and it's encrypted when it's in transit between the bus and the servers. Uh, what's really going to be exciting, and I think our parents are really going to love it, is that what is, when it's fully rolled out, and this is going to be soon that we're ready to turn this on, we're working through a few issues, just getting it ready to go, is it's going to receive a notification as a parent. If I elect to receive the notification for the first time in 130 years, I can receive a text that tells me when the bus is about to arrive in the morning or when the bus is about to arrive in the afternoon. So for parents, what we hear is that they're excited because it's going to limit the time that a student is exposed outside at the bus stop, either in the heat, the rain, the cold, or the dark. But also what we constantly get from families, and I see this in my own neighborhood, is families are excited about the fact, and they've asked for this for years, to limit the time that the family is at the bus stop, especially if they have newborns or little children. So they're excited about that, and I think it's really going to be a big deal. Especially at the secondary level, parents, it helps them to be able to follow the bus ridership of their child, to find out when they actually got on the bus or got off the bus. This is a <clears throat> redacted for the student, but an example notification of what I will be able to receive if I am a parent and I elect to receive it to tell me when the bus is going to arrive either in the morning or the afternoon. One neat thing about it is if my child does not ride the bus in the morning or afternoon, they will not necessarily receive this. So it's kind of a neat deal, and so we're getting it ready to go, and we're excited. So I think people know by now that we drive to the moon nearly 14 times and back in a year for CISD bus transportation. It's crazy. What I think they don't know is that we get we have students get on and off the bus nearly 25 million times a year. Wow. And in, in the case of doing that, it is very important that students get off at the right bus stop, whether they be an elementary student or a secondary student. And for sometimes similar reasons and for sometimes different reasons, it's very important to get off at the correct bus stop. So driving the bus, uh, you have the regular bus driver, and that's what we want every day. You also have sometimes standby drivers, office drivers, or you may have uh, special needs buses and mechanics driving. So an array of people will drive a bus over the course of a year. So what SmartTag does, it gives an audible cue to tell the driver, whomever they are, that the student is getting on and off or getting on and off the bus at the right stop. So it's another layer of security and safety for the kids to make sure they're getting off at the right place. It also helps our drivers, including all the different iterations of drivers, whether they're standby or regular mechanics, whatever, to help, to help ensure along with our current system that students that are pre-K or kindergarten are only released to authorized parents. So that's exciting. Another deal that's a big deal, especially early in the year, is that our drivers do a lot of, go through a lot of effort to make sure at the end of a run or a route that all the kids are off the bus. At the beginning of the year when it's really hot, kids can fall asleep. So it's another layer to make sure it tells them to make sure that everyone has gotten off the bus. It's, uh, I used to say the most challenging job in CISD was being a regular bus driver, and I was wrong. The hardest job in CISD by far, bar none, in my opinion, is being a standby or substitute bus driver. Well, you're driving a route through one of the fastest growing counties in America, you're driving through streets you may have never gone down before in your life with 60, 50, 60 kids on the bus that you have to get off at the right stop. 
So what happens is SmartTag makes sure, makes sure I take the correct path by giving me audible directions when I drive. And I can tell you as a, as a principal for two decades, it was not unusual at all that I would have a call or a parent come see me around 5 o'clock or 5.15 in the evening wanting to know where their child was on a bus. And I could never definitively tell them where that bus was. But now I can. And so I'm thinking, and based on the feedback I've gotten, it's going to be a real relief to parents, and they're really going to like that. I will tell you, we have a comprehensive website. If you have not gone to it, you can link to it from our transportation website. Just click on the Smart Tag tab. It tells you all about the cards. It tells you all about frequently asked questions. It's a wealth of information. All the news, all the letters that are going out to the feeders are included on that site, and it's really helpful. And so we're excited. Big day tomorrow, College Park Feeder, Cotcandy Creek and Conroe, and Washington High School just around the corner. So uh, I hope that is helpful. If there are any questions, myself or the team are here. Right. And we're excited. Good job, guys. I have a question. Yes. Um, why are, if it's just for buses, why are all students receiving the smart tag? Because students, we have about 40,000 students out of 71,000 students that ride the bus. Mm -hmm. What happens in the real world is that family situations change. Mm -hmm. And one day a student does and doesn't ride a bus, and the next day a family situation changes, and they need to be able to access CIC transportation. I will also tell you, as a long-time principal, you have a lot of students that through the fall, when they're in fall activities, whether it be marching band, cross country, volleyball, football, whatever the case may be, they don't ride a bus. But the day that that activity ends, they're all on the bus. So we don't know when a child is going to need to access a bus for CISD, and we want to make sure they have a badge and that they can access and get on. Now, we're still going to let them on. They'll have to, we'll have to punch their name in manually but it works best and it works most seamlessly when they have their badge. So we want to make sure everybody has what they need. Yeah. I'm just, I, the, I, the only, my only concern is I think it's wonderful on the front end. I think it's doing great things. Obviously it's going to save a lot of kids and heartache for parents. I, I'm a little concerned about the back end as far as like data and security. Um, I've been talking to, to some, some people, professionals in the field and um, I mean, it's super easy to just purchase an RFID reader on Amazon for $14 and pick up uh, someone else's card and replicate it. So I'm a little concerned about the safety aspect of the data that's out there. Um, and I would love to see some sort of, I know we love the parental consent, but I would love to see some sort of parental consent on these uh, smart tags. Well, I can tell you the badge contains a unique 14-digit ID that doesn't jive with anything. Mm -hmm. It's a random number that only means anything on a CISD RFID reader, smart tablet. And uh, we have an array of acronyms as far as security. We encrypt the data everywhere we go, uh, just like other sort of systems we have within the district mm -hmm. that we maintain. And so we do it with fidelity, yeah. and we aim to make sure we keep that data safe. And if they don't want to use it, they don't have to. They, don't they have can to. punch their name in every time they get on the bus. That's that's their choice. They can do that. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, again, like I said, I, I spoke to a lot of professionals um, that there's some real concern about the chips and the safety as far as human trafficking and cyber theft and replicating the yeah. tag. So. But yeah, I want to I want to I want to clarify that because oh, we are not storing any student information on the card. And we we did visit with your cyber mm -hmm. security guy on the mm -hmm. phone the other day. And I believe our team answered every one of his questions. Everything is secure. There is no information on that card that would lead to any of human trafficking, any of those things. If the card gets lost, if somebody read the card, it's, they're only going to get a 14-digit code. They're not going to get any, any information that leads them back to their home, their school, or any of those files. So, um, yeah, I think it came down to, the, to the where the data is stored is what is accessible. In the cloud. Yeah, so uh, it's it has the same protection that all of our information has that's yeah. in the cloud. I mean, there's we have data everywhere in the cloud, um, and it, it meets all of the same criteria. But once again, for for smart tags specifically, it's just that 14-digit code. It's not, um, I mean, and, and the student's address is out there in the in the cloud. Obviously, um, we have situations where student data is is, is everywhere out there, but. Um, it's all as protected as it can be. There's nothing is foolproof, right? right. Obviously, right. I mean, we I'd hate to be giant the corporations get hacked every day. So right. it, you know, we'd be naive to sit here and say it could never happen. Um, mm -hmm. But it could happen with any of our systems. Is the data encrypted? Yes, yes it's encrypted when it's at rest. 
it's encrypted when it's in transit. Mm -hmm. The badge is really very similar to the badge that I have on sure. and mm -hmm. many people in the studio audience have on right now. <laughs> it's a piece yeah. of plastic, not battery powered. Is the cloud maintained by a vendor or by us? Microsoft. By Microsoft. Mm -hmm. uh, does Microsoft do penetration testing, pen testing, as part of their cybersecurity protocols? Ron? Yeah, this is Brian Bisbee. <laughs> he works in our technology department. Hi, Brian. Hi, Brian. Step up to the mic, Brian. That way, yeah. we would be able to hear you. Secure good question. Yeah. Uh, does Microsoft do pen testing? I'm sure they do. Yeah. We don't necessarily have we that know. information, yeah. but it's hosted in the public cloud manager. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And does the district uh, do? Oh, we don't have our. We don't have Brian here, but uh, does the district do internal? Um, audits on IT general controls? Yes, we're doing one right now. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? No, I mean, it's pretty clear that uh, you guys don't really want to hear what we have to say, so I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not say I'm not, I don't feel good about the security of these chips. But can you be sp like specific? Other than I, just I, a I feeling? I said I can go on Amazon right now. It's not a feeling. I can go on Amazon right now and order an RFID ch chip reader but for fourteen ninety nine and get within uh, 10 feet, I believe, proximity, and read your chip and get all of your information. Why don't we and do also you, but he, but you, Why don't we you test that theory? Do you why understand don't you go get the Amazon reader. I'll okay. give you my kid's badge, okay. and you tell me everything it is about my kid. Okay. All right. We're good. I did. Thank you. Yeah. I do want to make sure we answer. I mean, that's why we took the phone call. I, I mean, I, yeah. I've done everything I've tried to I, think, I yeah. think it's wonderful what, what's happening on the front end. I'm concerned about what's happening on the back end. So it's or the, it's the, the Azure end. Cloud or it's the RFID it's reader? It's both. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I and I, I would love to see it as a parental consent. But thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, but if it's a parental consent, then they're not riding the bus. <sighs> not necessarily. No, yeah. You can ride the bus without a card? No, with, we, we either type them in or they use a card so that we know that they have, A, entered the bus, True. at which point, and then where they've been dropped off. Yeah, so it wouldn't solve, I mean, the, to, yeah. to your point, it's a fair point. Like, so carrying the card is a choice, but mm -hmm. being in the system itself is not a choice because if you're not in the system, then we, we don't have your record. We don't know where right. to take you. We don't know where to drop you off. Yeah. So that exactly. is a fair point. State audit. The state audit's part of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so prior to the tags, no one was, was logged into to a bus system. Now everyone's getting logged into a bus system that is riding the bus. Is that what you're saying? No, they were they were already still in our routing system. Mm -hmm. So it already was stored in the cloud. It just wasn't it wasn't functioning within the bus, but it was functioning within our systems and still in the cloud. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I am I am perplexed that you believe that buying a $15 reader is going to get into a system like like we would not check that out. I'm I'm okay. I'm I'm clearly I'm just surprised. I'm trying to with, withhold myself, but I am shocked okay. that you would believe that our district would be that careless. Oh, I'm not accusing our district. No, you actually are. You're saying oh anybody can go buy one and all the other stuff. It's just it's it's silly. It's silly. Yeah. All right, moving on to item C. Receive information regarding district-wide intruder detection audit report findings. Uh, President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Dole, I am here tonight to present the February update on the intruder detection audit. And as Mrs. Blakelock brings it up, I have some new news. We received information from the Texas School Safety Center for the fall. We received some numbers that 2,864 state campuses were audited in the fall of 2022. We do have some numbers now. 71% <clears throat> of those campuses audited all across the state of Texas did not have any corrective actions. Through today, we are currently at 92%. 23 of 25 campuses have been audited. Uh, only two had findings. We actually had two campuses audited today, and those were without, without findings. Furthermore, <coughs> we had six campuses audited in January. One campus in January, after we met for the board meeting, did have a finding. That campus went through the board approved, through, through the district safety and security approved uh, training. Mm -hmm. on next last Friday, February 17th, the same training I talked about the last time I was here with you in January. 
We're told there will be 10 campuses audited in February. Uh, five campuses have been audited so far in February, and we're running out of days. But uh, that's where we are as of tonight, and that's our update on the intruder detection audit. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. McCord. Very good. Great job, gentlemen. All right, we are moving into um, item seven, but before we do our public hearing, we do need to recess anyway to so yes, have sir. them set up, and we'll recess for the yes, next sir. five minutes.
All right, thank you all very much. At this time, uh, we will reconvene and now uh, we will be convening our public hearing on the 2021-2022 Texas Academic Performance Report, otherwise known as the TAPER. And uh, we will attempt to give you as many educational acronyms in the next 15 <laughs> minutes as possible. Dr. Taylor. Thank you. This is our 2021 annual report and the annual report is our final report for the 2021-22 school year. This is our final report of all of our accountability ratings that usually do not come until mid-November or December and this is after TEA has had a chance to look at any appeals in our data, hence this is our final report for the school year. The information in this report comes primarily from our taper and that is our Texas Academic Performance Report that Dr. Noll just mentioned. The taper also includes a multitude of data that includes student performance, staffing, programs, and different demographics in our district. And so I will highlight some of that information for you tonight. Before I get started, there is a group of people in our district that help put together this data or oversee this data on a daily basis and I would like to start out by thanking them. So if you are here tonight, please stand. The annual report consists of eight sections and I will review each section of the annual report. Keep in <laughs> mind that this information that you will hear tonight is housed at our Comro ISD accountability website. You will see this presentation, the taper, and the annual report itself. What I will provide tonight is just a highlight of the annual report. Section one comes from the taper. It is compiled for all of our campuses and district. The taper data comes from PINGS, which is our Public Education Information Management System. One thing to note about our PINGS data is that this data is collected in October, which is what we call snapshot. Our snapshot date is the last Friday in October of every school year. So that's when this data is collected. In the taper is a wide range of information and I will highlight some of that for you tonight. When you access the taper for our district or any campus, the first thing you will see is the accountability rating. For our district, our rating was a B and we also met requirements for all special education determination status codes. The taper will include enrollment data. And this is a historical view of our enrollment trends over the years. And as you can see, we have consistently grown in our student enrollment. On this slide, you see that as a snapshot of 2022, our student enrollment was at 70,812 students. As of today, we are at 71,262 students. The taper includes star performance for all subjects and grades tested in our district. It also includes the passing standards for the state assessment. Those passing standards, approaches, meets, and masters will be captured in the taper for every star assessment. This slide is just a view of how we performed at the approaches passing standard compared to some of our peer districts in the area. This is our performance at the meets passing standard compared to the state and some of our peer districts in the area. And then the highest passing standard on the state assessment, which is masters. This is how we've compared on that passing standard. Also included in our taper is our dropout rates. And as you can see, compared to our peer districts, we are doing well on our dropout rates. Another indicator that's captured in our taper is what we call CCMR. You've heard us speak about that before. That's our college career and military ready passing standards. So for our college ready, this is a comparison of some of our peer districts for the class of 2021. This is how it looks in taper. In order to be career ready, our students have to meet certain criteria to prove that they are career ready. And this is how we compare for college and military, career and military ready. Same scenario, the class of 2021 meets certain criteria to be career ready. One of the things to note about this data set 
is that military ready was not captured this year because the, the state is still working on a way to capture that data. So that data will come back into accountability moving forward. Student membership is captured in the taper. This is the percentage of student groups by breakdown. More than 80 languages other than English are spoken in the home of CISD students. We captured this data from home language surveys and this is a listing of languages in which at least 30 students reported as a, at home uh, a language other than English. Spanish is our highest uh, second language spoken in our district, followed by Arabic, Telugu, Urdu, and Vietnamese. What is Urdu? What is Marithi? <laughs> <laughs> We have various languages and nationalities in our district. Mm -hmm. This is our attendance rate. This is a 13 year trend and it shows that our attendance rate has gradually improved over time. One of the things to note is that in 2020, this was an anomaly because students had the ability to check in remotely during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. This is our attendance rate in comparison to our peer districts. Also in the taper is academic distinctions. And distinctions are an ability for a campus to earn this is based on a campus being in the top 10 of their 40 comparison groups. So our campuses are compared to campuses throughout the state that are similar to them in size and demographics. And so our, we have campuses who have earned distinctions in all eligible areas. So this is for academic growth. These are campuses that have earned a distinction for closing the gap. Distinctions in reading and ELA. Campuses that have earned distinctions in math. These are our campuses who have earned a distinction in science. And one thing to note is that pre-K through four campuses do not take science. Science doesn't start until fifth grade. And then our social studies distinctions are only available for junior high and high school campuses. So we are proud of the distinctions earned by our campuses. And then our last eligible distinction is our post-secondary ready, post-secondary readiness distinction. And these are the campuses who earn that distinction. Taper also includes staff information in comparison to the state. Some of the things you will see here include professional staff, auxiliary staff, average years of experience. One of the things to note here is our teacher turnover rate is lower than the state, and we continue to work on way ways to recruit and retain teachers. Taper reports the number of librarians and counselors for the district, in addition to the number of counselors and librarians on each campus. Section two of the taper is the actual financial data report. This comes from the state funding division. Mr. Rice provided a financial update at a previous board meeting. So section two of the taper is what's included in the annual report. We are proud that our finance department has won many financial awards and recognition. Go back also, to that slide, please. <laughs> What's those stars? The transparency stars. Transparency stars, stars yeah. in finance. Okay. Our tax rate is one of the lowest in the greatest Houston area. We are 16 cents below our peers and, 16, and have had a 16 cent decrease in the last four years. <coughs> our total operating expenditure expenses per student, this is in comparison to some of our peer districts.
Our unassigned fund balance as of August 31st, 2022 was over 173 mil. The board had since designated 48.8 million for the purchase of land and to create a bond contingency fund. So this puts our current unassigned fund balance at 124.5 million. Mm -hmm. This is our operating expenditures by function. A couple of things to note here is that we spend more on instruction than the <laughs> state. We spend considerably more on transportation and, and Mr. Uh, McCord alluded to that earlier with our trips to the moon. <laughs> and then we spend less on general administration. This Would you mind going back to that? Yeah. Just so I can look at it a little bit longer. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. The next slide is going to detail out to our peer districts too, so you'll be able to see. Yeah. It. But general admission. General administration. 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 Yeah. General administration is the far less than the state. Yeah. It's going to be far less because you're going to leverage your fix. You're in a large school district right here, like ours. Mm -hmm. It's going to look way less because your fix. You only have one superintendent versus a seventy thousand dollars, seventy thousand kids school district, whereas you had. A 30,000 school district with the same similar compensation structure gotcha. is going to be way higher. So the state example, right, mm -hmm. is uh, not a district even close to our, our side. Okay. Yeah, the next slide will really highlight that uh, for you. And this is how we compare in spending per student compared to our peer districts. And you can see there is some leverage across our districts and our peer districts when you look at those compared. The gap is not as large mm -hmm. for instruction. And general administration. Ciphers. Yeah, we, we do get economies of scale, right? When you when you being big, you can right. understood. Right. Ciphers. How how many students? Mm -hmm. there, uh, there, there are 119, mm -hmm. or somewhere in there, 115. Yeah. And their tax rate is. Much higher. Uh, much yeah. higher. <laughs> right. No, I, I, yes. I, I, yes. I mean it would almost be nice to have the tax rate on top of this yes to show right um, you know why Katie spends 63 percent on instruction well their tax rate allows a lot more no no that's okay I was just saying um, just for that individual breakout one more please. one more thank you mm -hmm. We're good. Okay. section three of the taper is basically uh, are we accredited as a district and yes we are Section four of the taper is our campus improvement plan. Each campus is required to have a campus improvement plan with performance objectives that are measurable. All of our campus improvement plans from last school year have been approved by the board and this school year have been approved by the board. Those are housed on the district website in addition to on every campus's website. Section five is our report on violent or criminal incidents. We are required to publish a report on violent criminal incidents that occur at each campus, including the number, rate, and type. In our district, we had 61 reportable criminal incidents at 10 different campuses, 55 of which were felony controlled substances. Most of these were due to vaping. We know that vaping has been a, a problem in our district and we have been working on a better solution to educate our students. Section six is our student performance in post-secondary institutions. And this is during their first year enrolled after they graduate from high school. This data comes from Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. And so what you will see here is our 2021 graduates that attend a four-year public university and a two-year public university. And these are our students that attend these universities in Texas. Dr. Povich shared this information in the fall. These are our graduates that are enrolled in Texas colleges and universities as reported. Some may, we may not have captured all students, but some do not report or some move out of state and we don't know it. So this is what we have for that section. Section seven is our progress 
of the district and each campus towards meeting House Bill 3 goals. And House Bill 3 goals were established by the board for early literacy and early math and CCMR. We've reported to the board twice on these indicators in June for early literacy and math and in November for CCMR. We will come back to the board for an update on our House Bill 3 goals this semester. And as a reminder of how this looks when we report on those House Bill 3 goals, we are looking at progress measure monitoring for kindergarten, first grade, and second grade in early literacy and early math. And we also look at monitoring our CCMR indicators for our secondary campuses. And the last section in the taper is our glossary. As you know, there are tons of acronyms thrown around in education and it can get a little confusing. The taper provides definitions, descriptions of methodologies used, and it lists sources for each data point. The taper is available, that glossary is available in English and Spanish. And again, all documents that were used to make this presentation of the annual report are available for public view on the Comro ISD accountability website. This concludes our public hearing. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Taylor. Thank you. Appreciate it. Would accept any any uh, comment if any public member has a comment they'd like to make. Can we go to the podium? <coughs> See y'all are as tired as I am. <laughs> as comfortable. Hold on. I think I will conclude our hearing, Mr. President. All right, thank you. We are back in session. Um, just look like we get. Okay, we are back in session. Time is 1027. Moving on to item 8, planning and construction. Item A is consider approval of the guaranteed maximum price amendment for the new Bartlett Elementary Flex 23 project and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute the contract documents. Mr. Foster. Good, good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Null. It's my pleasure to bring forward for your approval the guarantee maximum price amendment for our final new building in the 2019 bond uh, stable projects. In May of 2022, our board of trustees selected Duratech Inc. to be our construction manager at risk for the new Bartlett Elementary, Flex School Number 23, from our internal naming conventions. IBI, Duratech, and Conor ISD worked together uh, to develop a set of plans. Uh, specific to the job site and the location for Bartlett Elementary. Since then, we've been to the marketplace, received bids, and negotiated the guaranteed maximum price for this project of $37,933,268. Nice. This time, we're requesting your approval. Do you have a motion? So moved. Do we have second. a motion and a second? Any discussion? All right, hearing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor, show by the uplifted hand. Any opposed by the same sign? Motion carries unanimous. We're going to item B, consider and approve the selection of a construction manager at risk for the campus renovation 2024 project and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute the construction management at risk. Mr. Foster. At this time, we bring forward for your consideration and approval the selection of a construction manager at risk for the final project of our 2019 bond and capital plans. This is a project is our campus renovations for 2024. So this project is where we replace uh, units and systems inside the buildings that reach the end of their service life due to the, uh, safety and security upgrades while we're there on the campus as well. <coughs> we worked with DLR Group as our architect uh, for this particular uh, annual project. Uh, purchasing DLR and our department uh, published a request for qualifications, which is step one of our two-step selection process. We had two firms respond uh, to our RFQ uh, GTT, Inc., and Westfall Constructors. We invited both firms to participate in step two or the pricing portion of our selection process. And after receiving those prices, uh, grading as a, with our committee, uh, which our, our, our evaluation uh, ranking is part of your board item as well, uh, GTT, Inc. is selected as the offer who submitted the proposal to be the best value for the district. This time we're requesting your approval as GTT is our CM at risk for this project. Do we have a motion? So moved. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second for the motion? Second. Okay. Any questions or discussion? 
All right, seeing none, all those in favor of the motion shall by the lifted hand. Any opposed by the same sign? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Foster, and uh, we'll receive a capital improvement update. Some pretty pictures. Certainly, and now to bring you up to speed for our capital improvements we have underway throughout the district. So I'm going to begin with our safety and security project for 2024. Again, this is the final installment of our uh, safety and security projects, and by the end of this project and our, ca our campus renovations 2024 project uh, that we just approved the selection of the CM4, we will have visited every campus in the district during the course of our 2019 bond and capital plans. So the project for safety and security, this contract is underway. They're working above ceilings at nights on weekends, uh, making our, our campuses ready for the improvements to the fire alarm systems, the access control systems, the first responder radio systems, the other things that help create that uh, safe and secure environment for our campuses. The project is on schedule, and this particular installment will go through the year 2024, uh, but it is proceeding just as we would hope it would. At our new Moorhead Junior High School, as a, a junior high school in East County, you can see from our red picture, the athletic fields and the other venues are coming together nicely on the exterior. The building itself is dry and fully 100% secure. On the inside of the building, you're starting to see the personality and the, and the life of that building come together. Uh, you can see uh, finishes, light fixtures, things of that nature are, are coming in place. This building is scheduled to open for students in August of 2023, and it is on schedule. Our East County Transportation Center project, which is, shares a site with the new junior high school, you can see the underground utilities are what we've been talking about for the last couple of months. They're working on the building pad for the new building for that facility currently. That project is also on schedule and we'll open that for our Transportation Center's use in December of 2023. Right. Now our North Transportation Project, which is another project uh, associated uh, contractually with uh, junior high in East County, uh, that project is also scheduled to open for our use in December of 2023. You can see from our red picture here, the drainage pathways, things of that nature are under, under construction currently. We're working with the city on relocating some utilities we found underneath our proposed building location. Uh, that process is, is underway. The city's been relatively cooperative with us in that process. Uh, overall, that project has not yet been delayed. It is on schedule and we'll be there. Uh, and like I said, we'll open that new, new building uh, and the renovated shops for our North Transportation Center in December of 2023. At Conroe High School, this is our major renovation, major overall Conroe High School campus. Uh, from our overhead view, you can see the athletic building on the left side of the picture, the bright white roof on the left side of the building, mm -hmm. and then our CT uh, building, which is the other bright roof on the far right. Uh, we've got uh, the transformer we talked about last month has been installed. We've got power in those buildings. On the inside of the athletics, now you're seeing those uh, finishes and things of that nature come together. Uh, that project is moving along nicely, particularly since we have power now. And on the inside of the CTE wing, you're seeing light fixtures and all the other temporary facilities that we had in place uh, to continue that progress moving along nicely as well. We'll wrap both of those up in the spring semester and begin removing some of the other uh, older buildings on that campus from service uh, this summer. So scheduled for demolition are what we know as the Rotunda, which is where a lot of our CTE programs are currently housed. They'll move into their new facility this summer. And then the uh, freshman annex uh, is also scheduled for demolition as we get those two buildings out of our way, we'll be able to continue on through the rest of that project. Overall, the project is on schedule and we'll be there through uh, December 2025. Now at Oak Ridge High School, the overhaul of the Oak Ridge main building and the South County CTE program. Uh, we've showed you the new front door, so the campus is using that new front door currently for their, for their business operations, which means we took over their old front door. Uh, so we are uh, doing the demolition in the inside and on the outside to make use of those <coughs> former admin spaces for the academic purposes that, that we're intending for in the future. Uh, and then the CTE building is, is dry, it is uh, closed in and, and proceeding well on the inside. Overall, that project is on schedule. Uh, the, the new buildings will, will be in service when we return from the summer break. Uh, but this summer, we really dig back into the interior of the main building and start completing that transformation of the main street from one end to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, overall, that project will be completed uh, in August when students return from summer break. At Hines Elementary School, flex school number 22 <laughs> on our, on, um, in my office anyway, uh, as you can see from our red uh, picture there, that building is dried in uh, nicely and moving around well. On the inside, we're starting to see 
the personality you heard about, uh, Dr. Winkler mentioned earlier in the in the program. You can see we have light fixtures, we have ceiling grid, we have uh, new paint going on the walls. Uh, that progress is, is proceeding uh, as we had planned. It is on schedule, and we'll turn it over for students when they when they arrive after the summer break in August of 2023. In our new maintenance and child nutrition facility, this facility will bring all of our maintenance custodial and child nutrition under one roof for the first time in a very, very, very long time in Conroe ISD's history. The buildings themselves are, are dry and we're working on the inside to develop the offices and other things that will help the, the admin staff and all the other coordinators and supervisors uh, do their daily functions in those buildings. Uh, the warehouse spaces are, are going along nicely too. There's just not a lot of walls to show you in a warehouse space. So. Uh, but the overall, the project is on schedule. We'll take it over for our use uh, at the end of the spring semester uh, and let the, uh, let the, uh, the departments move into it uh, as they uh, prepare for their summer break and summer work. Uh, that project, as like I said, is on schedule. At Caney Creek High School, is our upgrades to the Caney Creek High School campus to better accommodate the 6A student population that's arriving there almost daily. You can see we've been talking about the front door and some of the other uh, uh, renovations on the inside. The building additions are clearly underway on the outside where we're expanding the weight room facilities and the locker rooms for the, for the uh, larger uh, population of student athletes and PE programs. Uh, the building itself uh, we're looking at would be the weight room addition. Uh, it is moving along nicely and we're built, putting in the building systems on the, uh, the other additions as well as we're moving through. Uh, that project is on schedule and we'll schedule to be there and they will be using these facilities uh, when the students return from the summer break uh, in the end of the summer. At Collins Intermediate, uh, we've we've turned over the, the new gymnasium for PE use in those buildings. I'm showing you pictures of the outside because the stuff that's going on in that campus now is the the replacement of some of the building systems on the inside. That we're procuring that uh, equipment, getting that building ready, so when the when the school ends at the end of May, uh, we'll replace those systems and return that building to operation in August of 2023 uh, without hitch. So that project is moving along nicely. Our campus renovations for 2023, this is our largest scope of work as a Giesinger Elementary where we're overhauling the air conditioning system there. Again, we're, we're procuring all the equipment so that when school ends at the end of May, we'll be able to have everything in, in hand that we need to turn that building back around and get it back in operation uh, when the students return from the summer break. Uh, so the procurement processes are on schedule and everything looks to be uh, in line for that work to begin in earnest at the end of May. Uh, likewise, that contract also includes the rebranding of Veterans Memorial, which is the current home of Moorhead Junior High School with the uh, mascot selection and some of the other items that you're going to hopefully approve for me next month. I'll have all the, the parts and pieces to complete the rebrand for that building. Meanwhile, we're working on the expanding the queuing line, so we're expanding the driveway to get more vehicles off of FM 1485, uh, which is going to be a, as much of improvement as we can possibly get with the land we own around that campus. So that progress uh, is beginning to start now and both the rebranding and the queuing expansion will be ready for school when they start in August of 2023. And that is our update. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Foster. I just wanted to say, you know, as getting the chance to tour some of these campuses that have had major construction updates like Conroe High School and, and Oak Ridge High School, um, you know, the work that your team oversees there makes a dramatic difference on on the students there and the staff there. And it cannot be stated enough, like what an improvement it is that this significant investment is made in these campuses. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah. And I just want to, to thank you and your team. It is such a relief to be able to trust uh, that these things are <laughs> executed in the way that the you know taxpayers uh, approve bond packages for. And just thank you so much for keeping us on schedule and keeping us on budget and making a real impact on on these campuses. Well, I appreciate Thank it. You. I'm really just a pretty face because it is a thing <laughs> behind me. As you can see, all, all of them left and went home already. <laughs> <laughs> but we, do have, uh, we do have a great team of professionals that work with us yeah. in my office yeah. and the, the folks that we hire to make these things do. We do. Yeah. We go through a very thoughtful process when we select our contractors. Uh, sometimes, you know, I mean, we do fight for the, for the least expensive. Right. Uh, right. A lot of times we are advocating for the best value 
uh, and sometimes that's not the least expensive, but it is. I think it shows in the, in the quality effort and our, and our financial accountability. So we, we do say thank you, uh, but we continue to hopefully prove ourselves day in and day out yes. by doing it the right way. Thank you. Well, don't discount that pretty face, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look at that smile. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> now he's right, right. <laughs> Blushing a little bit. <laughs> you have old man doing that. All right. All right, moving on to a prettier face. Uh, oh, uh, oh, item oh. number <laughs> nine. <laughs> uh, um, Let me ask you something, Mr. President. No offense, Mr. Reeves. We've had an opportunity to... This is Mr. Reeves. Yes, sir. We've had all had an opportunity to review all of this. If it's all the same to the fellow board members, would it be uh, acceptable to approve all of these with one fell swoop? If, if you're going to make a motion for that, I'm, I'm not procedurally. I'm not we sure can. we can. Mm -hmm. I, think know. We have to go through. I hear what you're saying. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. I okay. I said it's all the same, y'all. Let's, 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 let's do it. No, I think we, I think we I have like to go. Either after the word count in. Anyway, we have to go this one. But anyway, moving on to <laughs> good good idea though. I, I wish we could. Uh, Mr. Reeves been waiting five hours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure Give him his time to shine. This is my fun part. Though. <laughs> 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 this is, hey, now let's get, we're getting into it now. So. All right. Allow me to read this for you. Big words, man. Thank you. All right. Item A: Consider award of RFQ 121104 furniture for Moorhead Junior High School. Cool. Mr. Reeves. All right. Good evening, President Hubert, members of the board, and Dr. Null. Tonight we're requesting that the board considers awarding RFQ 221104 for the furniture for Moorhead Junior High um, to, for an estimated expenditure not to exceed $1.4 million. Uh, the request for quote pertaining to the administrative instructional furniture for Moorhead Junior High was emailed through our electronic e bidding system. The pricing does include total turnkey services, so delivery, assembly, trash removal. Yeah. Uh, we had seven vendors submit a response. We actually split to get best value. We actually awarded two vendors, so we give the uh, uh, administrative furniture to Indico Sales and then to our instructional side, we did uh, Educators Depot. Mm -hmm. um, the prices would be effective through next February. We worked with uh, Dr. Medford's office on uh, this proposal here. The funds are provided in the Capital Projects Fund, and at this time we request your approval. Okay. Do we have a motion? So moved. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second from Ms. Nelson. Any discussion? All those in favor show by the uplifted hand. Any opposed by the same sign. Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. All right. Item B, consider award of RFQ 221105 furniture for Heinz Elementary School. Um, we're requesting the board considers awarding RFQ 221105, this furniture for Heinz Elementary, uh, to Educators Depot for an estimated expenditure not to exceed 900000 Same process as before with Moorhead. We had seven responses. Um, this is for total turnkey services, including delivery, and assembly, and trash removal. Uh, the proposals were evaluated. We worked with Dr. Winkler's office on, on this project. Uh, the funds are provided in the Capital Projects Fund, and at this time we request your approval. Do we have a motion? Motion. All right, we have a motion. Do we have Thank a second? You. Ms. Soldenwelder was a second. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor of the motion show by the uplifted hand. Any opposed by the same sign? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Uh, item C, consider award of RFQ 221201 Musical Instruments and Supplies. All right. We're Mr. requesting Reeves. the board considers awarding RFP 2212-01 for musical instruments and supplies to the vendors that were listed on the attachment for an estimated expenditure of $735,000. This RFP was uh, sent out to pertaining to the purchase of new musical instruments, equipment, and supplies for the district. Uh, gone through our electronic e-bidding system and advertised on the CSD purchasing website and in the Conrail Courier. Uh, this request covers critical needs instruments and supplies district-wide as well as ordering for the two new schools for Moorhead and Hines. We had 23 responses. Uh, the pricing will be effective uh, through February of 2028, 2024. Mm -hmm. The catalog discount that's part of this will remain effective for one year from time of award. It will automatically renew for two additional one-year terms. Uh, these proposals were evaluated by the CISD Finance Department, including band directors and our music teachers throughout the district and reviewed by the Purchasing Department. The funds for this purchase will come from the CIC General Fund as well as the Capital Projects Fund. Best value offers are recommended for award, and at this time we request your approval. Okay. Do we have a motion? So moved. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All right. We have a motion and a second with Ms. Dungan. Any questions? All right. Call the vote. All those in favor, show by the uplifted hand. Be opposed by the same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. 
Uh, item D, consider award of CSP 221102, maintenance, repair, and operations job order, contract program, water well service, and replacement. All right. We're requesting that you, the board considers awarding CSP 221102 for maintenance, repair, and operations job order, contract pro program for water well service and replacement to our following vendors for an estimated annual expenditure of $60,000. We have O'Day Drilling Company, GC Electric, and Texas Operations and Professional Services. Um, competitive still proposals pertaining to our district's maintenance, repair, and operations job order contract program for water well service and replacement was released with the Gordian Group, who was approved by the board in April of 2016 to, to assist us with our job order contract program. Uh, we, the bid was emailed to our registered vendors through our electronic e-bid system, advertised two times in the courier. We did host a pre-proposal meeting for both of these two bids, the next one as well, to go over it with our uh, potential vendors. The vendors were asked to bid their adjustment factors based on our um, construction task catalog that Gordian hosts, so that we're able to get the pricing. Um, so that way we'll get preset unit prices on various water well services. All these unit prices are based on local labor, material, and equipment prices and for the direct cost of construction. The adjustment factor pricing will remain firm through February of 2024, renewing annually with four optional one-year terms through February of 2028. These proposals were evaluated by the maintenance department. Our best value offers were recommended for award and funds are provided in the general fund. At this time, we request your approval. Very approval. good. Do we have a motion? So moved. Ms. Nelson, motion. Do we have a second? Second. A second. Ms. Chase, any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, shall they have lifted hand? Any opposed by the same sign? Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Item E, which is consider, yes, consider award of CSP 221103, maintenance, repair, and operation, job order contract program, generator service, and replacement. Right. We're requesting the board considers awarding uh, CSP 221103 for uh, generator service and replacement. To the following vendors for an estimated annual expenditure of 150,000 GC Electric and Generator and Control Service LLC. Uh, very similar to the last bid, com competitive still proposals sorry. pertaining <laughs> to the MRO program were emailed and released to the, our uh, district's uh, eBid system, advertised in the courier. And th this group was also part of the pre bid meeting. Um, same thing as before, the vendors were asked to bid their adjustment factors based on their uh, task catalog. Uh, these prices will remain firm through February of 2024 as well, renewing annually with four optional one-year terms through February of 2028. These are also evaluated by the maintenance department. Best value offers are recommended and the funds are provided in the general fund. At this time, we request your approval. <coughs> okay. Do we have a motion? Motion. A motion, Ms. Chase. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. Nelson, any questions, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion shall be uplifted to hand. Any opposed by the same sign? Motion carries. All right, and item F, consider approval of RGV Mariachi Warehouse for a purchase of Mariachi uniforms and authorize the superintendent to negotiate and execute any documents necessary to effectively purchase, try on, and show how they <laughs> fit. <laughs> that is on tape. You might get people to sponsor. <laughs> 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 Finally, we're requesting the board approves the selection of RGV Mariachi Warehouse for an estimated expenditure not to exceed $70,000. The RGV Mariachi Warehouse is a supplier of instrument strings and uniforms specifically for Mariachi programs. Mm -hmm. The approval of this vendor will allow the district's high school Mariachi programs at the Woodlands High School and Conroe High School to purchase much needed supplies and uniforms that are not available from our current awarded vendors. The funding will be provided from the general fund. Um, the Texas Education Code Section 4431 requires that the contracts for the purchase of certain goods and services valued at 50000 or more in aggregate be made by the method that provides the best value for the district. In this case, uh, purchasing these through the districts in our local agreement through the Central Texas Purchasing Alliance, which we're members of with about 180, almost 200 other districts, um, using San Antonio ISD's contract for areas in fine arts, musical, electronic, and theater was determined to be the method of purchase that provided the best value for the district. At this time, we request your approval of this vendor and authorize a payment to the vendor not to exceed $70,000 for these supplies. Motion. Right. Second. A motion and a second. Any questions? So I, I just want to say, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, you know, this is one of our newest fine arts programs mm -hmm. in its second year, and um, we have just had such a wonderful response from our students. And I'm thrilled that we are getting their uniforms and getting them 
um, all geared up and ready to go. I, I look forward to welcoming them here at some point um, after they've won uh, contests and or uh, UIL recognition because they have just taken off and um, they sound fabulous. So I'm, I'm thrilled to, to add the uniform <laughs> along with it. Yeah, and I just, just to throw back to March of last year, we listened to public comment about how the mariachi uniforms were not available at Conroe High School and how, how disappointing it was and, and inequitable, right, that, that they did not have this. And so I'm thrilled that we're, we're able to bring a solution to that. And I did see at um, the Holly Jolly uh, Jingle, the mariachi band there, and it was delightful. So, yeah, if they could come and perform, that would also be a welcome addition they to the um, board meeting. Well, they opened for us at our... Um, Celebrate our schools. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For, uh, at the beginning of the year. I did a little dancing with Mr. <laughs> Upshaw, and uh, we had a great time. They're yes. fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Any other questions or comments <coughs> excuse me very good all right I'll call the vote all those in favor show by the elephant hand you opposed by the same sign ocean carries thank, thank you, you mr. Reeves. Thank also you. as we thank as you. we pull up mr. rice I assume for the next time I want to commend our board for the diligence and in, in doing the, the work to to make those go smoothly thank you for what y'all just making it go smooth and doing your due diligence appreciate it all right moving on to Oh, it's Miss Carson. I'm Perfect. sorry, I didn't see you back there. I apologize. <laughs> they strategically sit behind those uh, columns sometimes. <laughs> I, don't uh, uh, I hate to give away trade secrets in here. I don't blame you. Uh, I, I used to get to sit out there too. I didn't say. Do things, what you so have to do. Yeah. My feelings are hurt. Nobody said anything about my pretty face. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's because there was no competition. <laughs> That's right. Thank you, Miss Olden. Well, you <laughs> saved us. Did you hear that? <laughs> I said that's because there was no competition. That's right. Yes. That's All right. right. Well, I'm here this evening to present the financial statements for the month of January. First is our balance sheet. Our balance sheet shows the district assets, liabilities, and fund balance. And presented here is the general fund, the debt service fund, child nutrition, and self-funded insurance. Next statement is our income statement. It shows the district's revenues and expenditures. In the, gen in the general fund, we have revenue of just over $409 million for the year, total expenditures of $198 million. In debt service, $115 million in revenue, $6,000 in expenditures. We did process our first debt payment of the year last week, roughly $97 million. So that will be reflected next month on our statement. Taking a look at our local revenue um, in more detail, you can see the tax collections are well on their way. We have collected the bulk of our tax levy for the year. We are at 80%, which is right where we would expect to be this time of year. Um, in child nutrition, our largest source of revenue, of course, is food sales, and then in our self-funded insurance is premium contributions. Our 2019 bond referendum update, we have expended $543.7 million with 105.4 remaining. Our self-funded insurance update, it's been a couple of months since you got to see the update on our self-funded insurance plan. For the month of December, the plan performed very well. We had a surplus of 1.5 million. January, um, we had a deficit of 2.6 million. We did have one large claimant that triggered our stop loss insurance. So we do anticipate getting all of that deficit back from our stop loss insurance provider. Um, so taking that into consideration overall, the plan is performing very well year to date um, once we do get that reimbursement from our stop loss insurance provider. Your date revenue is 22.1 million, expenses 22.7 million for just a deficit of roughly under $560,000. Investments as of January 31st, par value is at 849 million. You can see we are flush with cash right now as tax collections are here. That's uh, very typical for this time of year. Um, Combined portfolio is yielding 4.36%, and then our benchmark, the 90 day T bill, is at 4.51. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Garza. Any questions for Ms. Garza? Thank you, Ms. Garza. All right. Very good. The board, we have executive session. So the board will go into closed session pursu pursuant to Section 551.071.
551 551.074, 551.076, 551.089 of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Any action, vote, or decision of the board with regard to any matter discussed in closed session will be made when the board returns to open session. The time is 10.55.
The board is now in open session at 12.23 a.m. Um, we have item 14, which is legal. Do we have a motion? I motion that we uh, authorize, approve the purchase of the land discussed in executive session and authorize the superintendent to enter into negotiations and execute that, approve that contract. And and authorize him to sign the contract. We have a second. A second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor shall have a lifted hand. Any opposed by the same sign? Motion carries. Entertain an idea. Motion to it. Oh, take request for trustees regarding future board agenda items. Does anybody have anything that they want to discuss at this time? All right. Very good. Are we adjourned? All right. We are adjourned.